the, the wonderful opportunity uh, for people to come visit me this year. So it made it all the more special. Nice. Nice. Uh, Rudy, how about you? Uh, varying from mild to moderately irritating, but overall not bad <laughs> for the most part. Um, I, I wish that Santa would have brought the guy who rear-ended our car and insurance policy beforehand, but he didn't. Um, but oh, that's right. okay anyways. You told me about that. I almost forgot. Oh, God, yeah. This guy, it's, he, honestly, he thought he had insurance, but he had a AAA roadside system. <laughs> Oh, oh. Like, okay. please go get insurance now that you've screwed me over don't do it to somebody else yeah that's that's unfortunate i mean it, it sounds like he had good intentions just the wrong direction he did he was texting me back for days like no i'm gonna figure it out i totally have insurance and then he texts me back and he's like yeah I, it turns out i don't have insurance. wow yeah. yeah but like i said everybody's fine so what, what can you do it's all good yeah yeah absolutely um, well, I want to, I want to take a quick moment here. I want to talk a little bit about why I do videos and this podcast, because I want to make sure people understand and know if they're in the right place to, to keep watching this. But I, I've talked about it. I had a real struggle trying to find a squadron. Um, the squadron I ended up actually flying with, I had joined four years before I actually flew with them. I think I shotgun joined four or five discords, went through some different experiences and Hey, how you do DCS and what works for you? I'll never judge, but I couldn't find what was right for me. And so one of the goals is to help direct people to a place that, you know, they can enjoy. And that started with knowing other squadrons and kind of lining up with what their thoughts were. I think that's advanced to people who are newer going to Hornet school, which I think is awesome. We're going to get into that in a second. But I also want to show people what it's like to fly in a squadron, trying to do things at a, at a higher level and, and challenge ourselves. Because I think the reward uh, the payoff from putting in the work to get all the skills down from the admin skills to flying off the boat, which we mostly do. I think it pays off in the end. And I think one of the ways that we'll get into that is actually discussing a little bit about the relationship with the Hornet School and one actual. And then we're going to talk about Rudy's experience of going through the Hornet School, joining us and kind of where his skills started and went to. So a few months back, we started doing some uh, podcasts. I had reached out to the Hornet School, and uh, you Hornet School folks, how has the response been from the community for you? Overwhelming. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> been it's been wild. Should I apologize now? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, all good. Uh, I mean, geez, Fet, uh, we we average almost about fifty people a week joining the yeah, Discord. We we go through spurts. It is funny watching like the, the growth and stuff. Cause there's definitely like ebbs and flows, but uh, yeah, it's, it just keeps on growing, man. Good word is spreading. We're uh, kind of pairing up with some other groups as well. Like kind of how we wait, 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 you in the past. we're not dating exclusively anymore. Yeah. I, I, I didn't mean to pull you aside. I didn't want to do this on the air. But, <laughs> I mean, look, I, I, I you're pretty, uh, no, it's uh, no, but we've just been growing leaps and bounds. It's it's out of control. I mean, in a yeah. good way. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome, absolutely. awesome people helping us. Like it's just leaps and bounds from where we started at. You know, almost a year ago. Yes, and and let me let me say like overwhelming in the sense that it is way beyond what I ever expected this to get. I thought this would always be come this be like a little small group maybe you know four instructors 70 people max you know now we're at i don't know 10 plus mentors and and it's just it's beyond any expectation i ever had so you know i it's it's been a resounding success so i i have nothing but great things to say about this and so the people that are coming First of all, I'm guessing they're seeing our podcasts and whatever, but what is their attitude? Like, what is their goal now that they've come there? So the goal is still the same. Um, I think they, they view these podcasts, uh, they hear about us through, through posts and, you know, they, 
they see that the best way to put this is when people look at DCS, they look at it all at once and it is very intimidating. And they see the Hornet School as a gateway to bridging. Hi, I'm a first person sim pilot or I am a uh, I'm, I'm new to the Hornet sim pilot to joining that first squadron. And I, you know, I, I think it's been an overall success. You know, it's interesting because one of my inspirations for this is there is no, you know, there is no infrastructure of like the real military. There's no laid out plan for you to go to with a bunch of cadre and people to fly with and a whole set of experience to just, you know, push all that information into your brain. And I think Hornet School is a good proxy for that. And so that's where I think, you know, if you want to enhance your skills and you want to learn the Hornet in particular, that's why I still think you guys are doing the Lord's work. Well, and even for the experienced pilots, man, come back. Cause like, I love going up with experienced dudes and just having them like, Hey, no one's judged me on an overhead break in a long time. You know, <laughs> give me a second set of eyes. Cause a lot of guys, you get used to doing it the same way, your muscle memory and everything. And you know, if no one's going to correct you, who will? So, uh, yeah, even those guys, I feel like gain even something from going through it. I mean, I know I do a lot of the fan flights for new people and I end up teaching quite a bit. And every time I teach it, I learn something or I remember something that I haven't done in a while. So it really helps keep your skills up. Absolutely. Well, I do know that, you know, if you are a member of the community and you want to get involved, um, there is a link in the description to the Hornet School. And I would say, please go there and try to give back a little bit of knowledge and help grow that and give a place for people who are new to not be so overwhelmed to get some experience. And though, you know, we don't have an exclusive relationship, uh, the truth is, is you can go anywhere to any squadron. These skills are going to help you, even if they do some things a little different. This basic package of information, I think, is very important. So, And same with the people who are experienced. If you want to come help us teach, that's uh, that's always on our on our watch list. People helping. So if you feel you got what it takes, come join up. Yeah, for sure. We need... We need people to keep that dream alive. And, um, you know, so if you are experienced in the Hornet or for another squadron looking to, you know, meet some new people, I think the Hornet School is a great place. Speaking of which, uh, Rudy, how are you tonight? I'm fine, Callie. How are you? Well, I'm going to tell our story. And you had posted in Wingman Finder. And I think I had messaged you about going to Hornet School. Did your post say you were new or was it me that dug that out of you when we talked? I can't remember. I think on some level my post indicated that I was new. I didn't know. I didn't realize how new I was at the time. <laughs> but, I, I, but I think my post did indicate that. So prior to you posting and joining the Hornet School, what was your experience with flight sims, DCS, working with the squadron, stuff like that? Uh, DCS is my first flight sim, as far as I can remember. Um, I had no experience working with a squadron, very little in DCS. Like a lot of people, I know this is cringy to say, but like a lot of people, I first got into DCS by watching growling sidewinders videos, like late in COVID. <laughs> um, and I thought like, Hey, that fighter jets look cool. Um, so I later found out that DCS was free. It took me like a month to figure that out. Um, and then I downloaded it and I was trying to fly around with my keyboard and then I bought a Logitech G extreme for $20 off of Facebook marketplace. But that still had to be a massive upgrade from a keyboard, right? Oh my God. Yeah. It was, it was transformative from, from the keyboard for sure. Uh, but it was mainly just tooling around in the, in the SG 25 T, which to be honest, I still enjoy that jet to this day. Nice, nice. Um, they were saying your guys' volume was a little low. I just turned them up. Um, so when you got that, how much time had you spent in DCS? Like how many hours doing and, and what did you end up doing? When I got the Hornet, you mean? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Well, once you started yeah. flying DCS in general. 
Yeah, when I started flying DCS, I probably I probably flew um, I probably flew the Su twenty five T for like thirty hours, just trying to get a handle on flying in general. Um, and then I just started trialing different. You know, like DCS has like two week trial you can do for any of the modules. And then I eventually settled on the Hornet after trying both that and the Viper. And the Viper kind of drove me out of my mind. No offense to any Viper pilots who might be listening. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I'm gonna and then I would say um, by the time I messaged on Wingman Finder and heard back from you, I, I would say I had maybe about 30 hours in the Hornet. At that point, I had gone through all of like the little training missions that the module comes with a couple of times over, and then I was uh, basically trying to take the next step and stop dropping GBU twelves on random tanks on my local host and maybe fly with some folks. That's exactly what I did, and it was boring once I figured it out because I had no context, no reason, no teamwork. So. Um, I'm glad we shared that, but I think we also shared, it sounded like you did the trainings cause you had a desire to learn, I'm guessing. Yeah. I mean, I'm a bit of a nerd at the end of the day. Um, I like to dig into stuff and kind of figure out how it works and, and how to do it appropriately to the best of my ability. You know, I'm a, I'm a goal driven person and, uh, I work best when I have some goal that I'm going to achieve and some outcome I'm looking for. So for me, not having that in DCS and just flying around, I was kind of rudderless and just like, okay, this is cool, but what am I actually doing? Right? I don't know if that drove you at all. Uh, for sure. Sh- you know, I think it did to an extent, but there was also a more basic thing there of just like, I'm just looking for something interesting to do. And- <laughs> Like I said, I just at the time I just I had no idea how deep the well of DCS runs, right? Like it was the, I had this it was kind of like another video game at that point. Still, it was just like okay, like I can fly this thing, like I should fly with some people online because that might be interesting. Um, and it's not until I you know hooked up with all these guys that I realized like oh my god, like I have no idea how to fly this thing, right? And and that and that for me is where the goals really started to kick in. And it's kind of the first time I've conceived of, uh, to be honest, like a video game, quite frankly, as being a thing that can offer goals. Interesting. So let's talk about what was your first thing, and if you want to, you know tout your guys' syllabus a little bit here, go for it. But what was the first thing you did and what was that experience like? The first thing I did at Hornet School? Yes, sir. Uh, Well, I mean, to be extra clear, the first thing that one does at Hornet School is there's an interview. Um, So we we interview all of the students who come in to get a sense of what their goals are and where they're at and like what their sort of dedication is to potentially finishing the program. Um, so I spent some time talking with Echo, um, who's unfortunately not here tonight. Um, <laughs> had a really nice chat about Hornet School. Um, I'm glad that I did that because uh, just reaching out to random people on the internet and asking them to help me is not really my thing. Um, but Echo is super accommodating and super nice and that kind of got me motivated. And then I'd say the first bit of flying I did with was with Fett, actually. And Uh-oh. Fett taught, taught me how to do oh, Lord. <laughs> the, over, the overhead break. Um, and like I had looked, you know, I read it on the syllabus, like overhead break. And I went and looked at a diagram and I was like, oh, like no big deal. Right. Like fly in a circle, gently crash the plane into the runway. Like, problem <laughs> solved. And so- that's when I, that's when I started to, you know, get the concept of like oh no there's on speed aoa and there's you know managing your thrust in a turn to you know to keep lift and it's just it went it went really deep and that kind of got me pretty hooked well let's talk a little bit about the interview because some people might be like you like ooh, an interview they want to talk to me let's let's talk about what are the goals of the interview and what are you guys trying to do uh, so the- i'll let fett take that one yeah yeah i was gonna say i mean really it's it's very informal you know we're not asking for your date of birth or anything you know previous work experience it's more just like uh one how we do things just how the syllabus works how our scheduling with the mentor works you know just kind of 
going through the logistics of how to go through the training. Um, so that way there's no confusion for anyone where to find all the resources, etc. And then just ask them, you know, how long have you been flying? You know, what are you, what are you looking to, to get out of this? Um, you know, that way we can just kind of gauge some guys, you know, come in and they just want to like, yeah, just teach me the syllabus. Like I'm cool with just that. Some guys come in and they're like, Hey, I want to learn the syllabus and whatever else you're willing to teach me. Um, we try to accommodate both, you know, as time avails, but you know, it's, it's just more just to get to know the person. Like what's, uh, are you going to be here for the long haul? That kind of thing. And then to like, we all kind of develop little relationships with each other over the time you, you train with us and we work now. Ex I'm sorry, again, we're not exclusive, you know, with a few other groups and we <laughs> want to like put you in the right direction. We want to like, you know, if you're coming to us with that desire to be like a sim pilot, like, dude, I'm going to send you over to Cali when you're done. Like if, if you, if I think you've got the chops to go fly with him, you know, I'm going to send him your way. If I know some other groups that you're going to fit in great with, you know, we're going to try to point you in the right direction at the end of it all. Cause that's ultimately the goal is to, to kick you out the other side. <laughs> so something completely different and a better path. And so I want to make sure people understand what that is and that the interview is really just about getting to know you kind of understand your goals and, and lining you up with what Hornet school can do. It shouldn't be intimidating to you or whatever. And you know, maybe you find it's for you, maybe you don't, but at least it's an option that can help give you direction. And so I was that I was gonna say it's a super informal process just to see what your expectation and um <clears throat> what your goals are yeah did someone just say i love you uh i thought i was muted i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> i love you too whole, wholesome moment of the, the, the whole podcast no that yeah. was my six that was my six-year-old but i love you guys too <laughs> it's not the podcast isn't going to get any better from here i'll just tell you how that was yeah, the peak complete, completely thought i was muted on that that's awesome <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna mute myself now. <laughs> <laughs> well no actually I, I need you now because you uh, said yeah i know you said that you wouldn't normally reach out so you must have had a good feeling you did some um that you know you did some flights and whatever um how how long did it take for you to get through hornet school it took me one month, um, but I got a little bit obsessed. Um, I think at the where the curriculum was at the time, I think uh, what Echo uh, suggested was it would probably take a month and a half. Um, the curriculum has grown uh, very slightly now, so I'm not sure what the estimate would be. But yeah, it took me uh, almost exactly one month. And when you say obsessed... Uh, we're going to talk about this when we get into the wingman guide about flying consistently. Do you want to confess your sins as to how often you were flying? <laughs> I don't know how often I was flying. Um, when I was uh, preparing for my carrier qualification exam, um, I stopped I stopped logging on my notepad at 192 reps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Do, it, do with that what you what you will it, if it makes you feel any better it showed in your cq it looked great i got really obsessed with that like and that's you know something i would say for the hornet school having gone through it is you know the guys have done a really good job of building an environment that just makes people want to do well like it's it's really supportive but also like pretty chill like nobody's barking down your you know your neck telling you to do better or get in there and train more they just they're very supportive and and for some reason all the people who come through the door there they're just they're trying really hard and there's a great community of trainees that are uh struggling with stuff and helping each other and moving forward and i mean i've seen good and bad in this community mostly i see good and it's one of those examples of that. So I appreciate it. Um, I think just to paint a little context before we move on, what it was like to be in a squadron, let me make sure I have this correct and you guys can, you know, yell at me if I'm missing it. So you guys are going to cover administrative skills, flying case one pattern, um, how to fly in a formation, tanking, navigation, um, a lot of the basic skills that I as a squadron leader care about far more than I care about your ability to drop bombs. 
Uh, is there other things you want to touch on from the Hornet School about what you guys cover? I mean, you pretty much nailed it. Uh, my only addition, my only addition, I would add is, um, you know, in-flight emergencies. So, oh yeah, you know, hey, uh, we just got hit with a uh, AMRAM. Um, thank God it was a glancing blow, but I've lost my left engine. Can I still land? So, I mean, we even cover that too. Um, left engine out, right engine out, fly spin recovery, all kinds of stuff like that. I still want to do that portion with you guys because it's not something I've actually dug much into. Um, I mean, so I've tried to flat spin every jet I've ever flown in DCS, but I don't know that I've done the official recovery always perfect. So I, one day I need to come do that. Maybe we'll do a live stream on it. Please do. It's really fun in VR. <laughs> <I don't> <laughs> <know>. <laughs> well, the jet does everything for you. I mean, come on. Yeah, the Hornet's pretty straightforward. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what I'm looking for from a squadron. And, and I hope I'm kind of representing other squadrons. But, you know, number one is someone we get along with that's dedicated enough that wants to learn and has you know right attitude. And then someone who, you know, at least for us, we don't have a great training program for someone who's brand new. Uh, in fact, we don't, we're terrible at that, but having the Hornet school do that. And then having someone come to us, having some basic knowledge of the jet, having the basic understanding of how we fly at a realistic level is absolutely huge to us. Um, so I'm going to say when we met Rudy and did a fan flight, we'll talk about that. But let's go into, Rudy, how did you feel after Hornet School? Where was your confidence? What were your thoughts, you know, and your goals after Hornet School? Uh, I was feeling really confident after Hornet School. Uh, possibly slightly overconfident, but it was it was such a fun experience that it, I was feeling really good about it. It was Echo and Hornet who suggested that I reach out to you about one actual. And my first response was, there's no way I could do that. Like I've seen, <laughs> I've seen Callie's face. Like, I've, like, I've, watched, I've watched those guys fly. I can't do it. And I was, I was kind of lightly to bordering on severely chastised by Hornet for having, that, having that attitude. <laughs> um, and then I, I just, I decided to, go for it and just reach out because I was, I mean, the reason I went to Hornet school is I was interested in getting to the point that I could fly with other people and, and do interesting missions and, and have fun. So I, I, I gave it a shot. Well, it's funny because I actually want to do the opposite of what you're saying is to intimidate people. I want to welcome people to challenge themselves. I know we fly with real world JTACs and real world AWACS guys. And now we have some real world Navy controllers we're working with, but I, I want it to be, welcoming and I want um, uh, I want people to feel like you know this is something that they can achieve it's, it's not going to be easy it's going to take work but I don't think I, the people that are successful we're going to get into this in the Wigman's guide are the people who put an effort and consistency I, I, I think that is really some of the biggest keys but anyhow I'm glad you decided to come with us I know when we had our first discussion I could feel that, you know, your, your motivation and kind of your mentality was right along the lines of the guys that we fly with. Um, and no, Grendel, I'm not going to keep you hidden forever, but we will make you talk in here in a minute. Um, but what did you think when you came to us and you did your first fan flight? How was that for you? Uh, the first fan flight was um, really overwhelming and just incredible in terms of the experience and I, I mean overwhelming in a positive way like i had trouble sleeping um after that because after just, the fam flight <laughs> yeah after the, after the fam flight and again i want to be clear it's not because it was bad or terrible it's just because i it was a totally different experience from learning how to fly the jet it's like okay now you're going to learn how to operate the jet with other people right and well let me try to try to coordinate and 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 be there and it was just it was it was a total rush so our fan flight consists of taking off from a small air base um was there anybody with us on that flight or was it just you and i no we'd have we had four on that one that was you and i and grendel i want to i want to say grendel and maybe rolds maybe i can't remember who the who the fourth was but we definitely had four so that makes it harder so we take off, we get in formation, 
Um, we fly over to a range. We do what's called talk on. So we're using the at FLIR and I'm making sure someone knows how to use the at FLIR directionally, north, south, east, and west. Because if I tell you to the right, who's right and where doesn't make any sense. Um, we do some calls on the radio and where there's four jets. Now there's four radios talking. And what we're really getting into is teamwork and being vertically deconflicted in an airspace and going out and coming in the same direction so we're not bombing towards each other. And there's a lot of little skills that get revealed in that. There's a lot of little things I do that probably seem easy, but I'm able to tell a lot from doing them. Um, so interesting. So you couldn't sleep, but you enjoyed it, right? Yeah, I couldn't sleep because I was just thinking about it. I was just I was thinking about what a cool experience that was, you know, coordinating those bombing runs. And, you know, we'd worked together for two hours, but I'd, I'd learned so much, you know, even from just those two hours uh, that I was kind of going over and over it in my head and like how I could do it better next time. And I was excited for the future because you guys were, you know, like you said, you guys take it seriously like you're, you're trying to fly to the best of your ability but also like everybody was chill about it like if i made a mistake it wasn't a big deal it's just like okay here's how you do this um you know try that next time yeah really fun well you're you're foreshadowing some things we're going to talk about in a good wingman's guide so your fan flight was good we welcomed you in we welcome you to come to us and do some of the other fan flights because we have a total of four what has been what would you say in all the flights you've done with us and you now have done all the way you've done the admin flying, which is tack turns, case one recovery, aero refueling. You did the airspace awareness where we put you in a very specific block of airspace and tell you to maintain that while working sensors, which is a very important skill for working air to ground. Um, what do you, how do you think Hornet school prepared you and how do you feel you are doing so, so far in one actual? I think um, I think Hornet School prepared me really well for that. Um, there haven't been very many circumstances in which you have said or Grindel has said, "Do this thing with the jet," you know, or, and kind of make it work. Like I I have a good familiarity with how to work the jet from going through Hornet School. Um, the things that have been different and that I've been learning is more like how to, again, how to operate with the jet. So like, you know, I could manipulate the HSI, for example, in a thousand different ways before I came to one actual, but I didn't know how to hold a keyhole. And I didn't know how to, you know, set up an attack such that I would be there if I was supposed to be inbound 60 seconds after the last guy dropped his bomb, right? Um, so that, uh, Oh, when we did the, we did the time sequential. Yeah. Yeah. yeah People aren't yeah. used to that. The sequential bomb drops. Yeah. Yeah. No, ex exactly. So like in terms of being prepared to fly the jet, I would say I was very prepared. Um, you know, some aspects of flying the jet are always going to get better through time, right? Like Hornet school can, can pretty well teach you how to use the HSI. Well, um, I would say it can help you learn how to fly formation. If you follow my, my difference between those two things like one of them is just a thing you do formulaically and one of them just develops you know re involves developing a feel through time flying formation hitting the tanker things of that nature for uh, those, so those that, can go ahead good i was gonna say for those that don't know i'm huge on the hsi course line i use or on a target point or whatever i use the course line for everything as a flight lead in planning so i'm glad that you've seen that and understand it but continue yeah, that's, I think that's pretty much all I was going to say. I think in terms of, you know, being able to fly your jet and manage its systems, the Hornet School does a great job of prepping you for going out and joining a squadron. And then the squadron is going to teach you the things, you know, about how they like to do things, how they like to do close air support, how they like to do, you know, air to air engagements and specific aspects of their, of their admin procedures. Well, in, you know, I, I would say we're hard to fly with because we fly to those realistic standards because we work with real world people. And our goal is to give them positive training reps. we got a couple of guys that are, you know, been through training, a couple of guys that are, um, you know, deployed. we got a couple of guys who have promoted. And so we have all these different experience levels. And when they come work with us and we give them positive training reps and they build missions that are challenging to us, but get them into the mental space they need to be for their things. It's a good symbiotic relationship and I really enjoy it, but it's not easy, right? Because you haven't done, have you done a cast mission yet where we just kind of guided you through it or not? Uh, nope. Nope. Okay. Not yet. 
So you think the comms were heavy so far because we're a very comms heavy <laughs> squadron. Wait till the primary radio never stops because there's another flight in the AO constantly communicating with the JTAC while we're trying to talk interflight and the comms is just overwhelming, which violates one of the rules I'm going to talk about being a good wingman, but sometimes it just happens that way. Yeah, it's it's really and it's good. It's it's fun. It's but that's been one of the biggest challenges, I would say, coming out of Hornet School and coming to a place like One Actual. It's just managing the information flow um, <laughs> that occurs within a flight. Well, and I don't know, Fett and and uh, Shaker and Mast Hornet, how much uh, calm stuff do you guys get into in Hornet School? Like, how much radio communication uh, do you have guys get into? I'd say the most that we get into is Case 1. And I know Case 1, historically, is supposed to be cyclical operations, very, very zip-lip. But that's when we really start to press hey, we want a call and we want an echo. We want you know you to transmit and you to receive. And not only to receive and be like, yeah, 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 he just said you know X, Y, Z, but to take the extra step, extra step and, oh, he said this. I need to retain this. I need to, to adjust or manipulate something within my cockpit to reflect what he just said. So we, we introduce comms towards the... F- really heavy comms towards the final aspect of our program, which is, you know, case one operations to, I don't know, condition you to be so task saturated that you can still interpret, understand, and, um, you know, go that extra step to say, you know, Hey, he said this, I need to reply this he said this i need to input this into my instruments so not till the very very end of our curriculum do we really start to introduce heavy comms we start off in the very beginning with just ctaf information um ctaf comms so hey uh you know by day two you should be saying hey um i plan on taking off at this airport i uh this is me this is what i tend on doing um but as you get through the program, you get very comfortable with uh, CTAF operations. By the time you get to our case one lesson, you should have the confidence of talking on the radio and the skills with the jet that you can do both at the same time. So, and I think what that's really building, if we want to break those down as skills, is two critical factors. One is how much stuff you can pay attention to. So how much task saturation or how big your pilot bucket is growing that really helps working with the squadron because if you don't have that, you can't do a couple things at once and you start losing the scan, right? So aviate, navigate, communicate, you're going to lose one of those and it becomes a problem. So that's very important. And then my other favorite topic that I think I've coined and, but I'm going to at least claim it. And that's concentration, dollars. concentration, concentration dollars. dollars. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you say tax dollars, Hornet. Concentration. I did. I was gonna. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I did say tax dollars. Concentration dollars. Yeah. So to me, concentration dollars, it's very important. Um, it happens with a lot of people that fly with us. We will do some training, get them prepped up and used to us and basic stuff. And then we'll go do a more complicated mission, maybe take them into an AO doing close air support. Uh, we'll walk them through a lot of it so they don't have to do the comms and I can kind of guide them through it. And by the time they get back to the boat, they can't land the same way because they've spent, you know, think of it as a bank account. As you're flying and doing things, and we're going to talk more about this as being a good wingman, how to save your concentration dollars. But every time you do something, every time you talk on the radio, every time you navigate, every time you punch something into your targeting pod, you're spending those dollars, right? And I've had missions where I come back and I am spent and I'm like, man, why is this so hard? Why am I not hitting my numbers? And it's because my concentration dollars are running low. So building both of those up, building your ability to be task saturated and still function and have enough concentration dollars to get you all the way through the mission and back. And that's, that's as much as all the individual skills are important. Those are two skills that I think are critical. So I'm glad you guys work on those. Absolutely. 
All right. So Rudy, uh, I will say this. Uh, well, hopefully one actual has been motivating for you to fly with and we haven't scared you off yet. 100%. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. And you've been motivated and you fly consistently. Um, so I appreciate it. I think you've done a good job. Grendel, I am going to call on you a bit. I know you've flown with Rudy. What's been your experience flying with Rudy? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> No, I I uh, I don't always remember a lot of fan flights, but I I remember the one with Rudy, um, and it, it was pretty evident early on that he knew what he was doing. Because um, I do fly a lot of fan flights with McCallie. You do? So, yeah, I mean, I you know I always fly usually as dash three in a fan flight and if if dash two which what rudy was if if he can't hold formation um that makes my life a lot more difficult in that fan flight well usually I, it just means i have to separate off and give people a little room but you know Rudy did a great job and and you know sometimes i have a concern that man <laughs> on his on his fan flight he had you had four Hornets. Did you have, was there a Harrier in the airspace too, or was it just us? I think there was a random Harrier that kind of migrated into the airspace. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I have a vague recollection of that, but not super clear because in, in Callie's concentration dollars uh, parlance, I was fully overdrafted by the end <laughs> of that flight. So, Yeah, so you were, and, and what Callie will do is if you're having an easy time, you'll ramp it up. So. Yeah, I, I, so that's something I try to do is I try to find out where you're at and I try to make it so that you're just at your limit, maybe slightly over, but bring it back. I try to, I try to push it as far as I can because it helps me identify who you are. And with four jets in our flight and probably one or two other Harriers doing stuff, having to talk inner flight and then pry comms back and forth. It's a lot to take on if you haven't done that before. Yeah, it was, it was a, it was a transformative experience for sure. Yeah. Um, but like I said, you get used to it and it's, you know, we did the, we did the third fam flight recently, airspace awareness, and we were flying around and I found myself thinking halfway through, like, why am I actually doing like most of the things that Kathy is telling me to do without messing up, messing them up in a horrible fashion? Um, so it was kind of like, you know, it's just like you said, building that concentration and building that familiarity with, with how to deal with things coming at you. Well, and getting your systems down in the jet and people aren't used to having to write down grids and repeat them back and a lot of the things that we do. So you get that down with everything else. And that's why we're, I think you can probably feel now, um, have you watched the Cassis chicken video we sent, we sent out in the welcome kit? Have you watched that at all, Rudy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm guessing watching that, you can see some of the stepping stones and where we're going, right? Yeah. In fact, I just rewatched one of them this morning and I was thinking, okay, like there's, there's a lot still to do here. <laughs> there's a ton, but we're, we're, we're working into it. So yeah, it's all good. Anyhow, I wanted to share this story because, um, you know, it's one thing to talk about Hornet School. It's one thing for these guys to get on or share the syllabus like we have. But I wanted to share a story of someone who's gone through it, what their experience was like. So maybe it opened the door for people who are thinking about it and get a feel for what that is. So Rudy, I appreciate you sharing your story and talking with us. Uh, I'm looking forward to flying with you more. And uh, I don't know, uh, Fett, anybody from Hornet School, you guys got anything else before we move on to the Wingman Guide? Uh, no, we do, just I got too. I'd love for uh, for Shaker to get a chance to talk about as a mentor from the mentor side what it's like, uh, the enjoyment, and um, it, it's re it really is enjoyable to watch you know these light bulbs these light bulbs go off, and to watch a student progress from you know not knowing anything to, hey, you know, this person is actually fun to fly with. I'd consider them as a wingman. Um, so, Shaker, if you if you do have the time, I'd love for you to give that kind of point of view as a uh, mentor within the school. Yeah, absolutely. And, like, I was just about to, you know, comment on Rudy. Um, he's the perfect example of the relationship between the Hornet School and one actual you sent him to the Hornet School. Hornet School sent uh, a good product back to you where, 
he's not lost in the sauce and creating trouble for you as a lead or someone someone up in the air with with no knowledge of anything and you know rudy i think had just gotten done with his cqs or was about to get it and he he said to me on the side like i i want to get better at formation so i said okay and we were we were on the boat and everybody got done i said hey let's go up while we got time and no one else is around we'll just go do some formation stuff real quick and we've both been on for a while but we both have that dedication to the school and helping each other out where we took the extra time just to go up and you know i'm easy flying around as a lead and i'm like hey man just don't worry about hitting me i want you to find out where too close is for you and because that was a concern for him was you know how how close he felt comfortable so i said you'll find out how close you are what too close is when you hit me and it's not a big deal like I want you to find that space where you're comfortable flying around. And, you know, he did it. We, we had the flight. It was great. And now he's off to the races. And it, it, like I said, it's a perfect example. Um, so Rudy, good job, man. But I found, I found out where too close was on that flight too, <laughs> as, as I recall. Yeah. But like, and that's the thing is like, it's okay to, this is why we're here is to, to find out these things and mess up. And this is the place to do it um without without any problems but uh on the mentor side you know i i reached out uh to echo a while back um to give back to the hornet school because i was longing for something like the hornet school when i was first starting up so i'm like you know what like i really like to teach i like to see people get better uh and and see that enjoyment and watch things click and the excitement they get when they are able to do one little thing at a time. And, uh, I was able to, to come here. I had an interview with these guys as like a potential mentor started showing up, uh, got active in the discord. And, uh, I've been able to see guys like Rudy and, and, and other guys just learn the basics and then not master those basics, but become so proficient at it where they got the muscle memory and became, and became so easy for them. And you just see how happy they are that they're learning here. And, you know, it's not just me, it's everybody involved. Even, even other guys that are are learning and still going through the program, they're always up in the, in the server flying around and you'll see groups at all going out together, practicing things and, they're all learning off each other. They're learning off us and we're learning from them at the same time. And um, like, that's really what I, I love about the Hornet school and everybody involved, students, mentors, admin guys, we're all here for the, the same, the same common, uh, I guess, uh, what's a good word? Uh, the, the end product at the end of the day is what we're looking for and having fun while doing it. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad we have, I'm glad we have this community and, you know, being able to be live here on YouTube and share that. And these stories about the mentors and the people that come through, I think that's great. And it, and it really comes down to the people caring and wanting to, and I know the Hornet school guys do. So I deeply appreciate that. Baker was the first guy that ever tried to teach me form. And I think it was 30 minutes before I got within like a half nautical mile <laughs> of where he was at. <laughs> and then he peeled off and he's like, no, nah, I'm going to sh show you some stuff and talk you through it. And I was technically lead for a second. He got on my wing and I was basically like, that's not possible. Like I can't, like I'll, I'll, I'll never be able to do that. Like never, ever, ever. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Hornet and I, we did that live stream about flying form. And I think we demonstrated some good skills with your high tech cartoons and then us flying. Um, so I hope that's helpful. And, and those skills, they take time. And I got to tell you, it's one of the harder skills. But once you get it, aero refueling and everything else just becomes a lot more easy. Yeah, uh, A lot of what we teach and, and a lot of what everybody says is, Aerial refueling is like form flight. So the better you get at one, 
the better you'll be at the other and it it just becomes muscle memory at that point absolutely um good oh i was gonna say you know you know me i'll always preach that form flight you know it is such a mandatory uh skill set that you have in order to uh you know fly these uh fly these jets right whether you're flying the 16 or the 18 you've got to come in for fuel at some point and you know back in the 50s people didn't think this kind of uh this formation flight was possible so they completely out out uh, like you know they uh they completely just said hey you know air air to air refueling was just not possible and you know over the years we demonstrated hey it is and you know around the uh, 60s 70s we said you know what actually this is so you know fast forward to today and even fast forwarding further into the sim you I, I can't tell you how many people I have seen post in a, some Facebook chat that, or some or read, some Reddit forum that, oh man, air to air is impossible, or I can't do it. You know, I say to them every single time, start with the fundamentals. Can you even fly off the wing of the carry of the uh, of the um, C one hundred and thirty or the KC one hundred and thirty? And, you know, start with the fundamentals. Can you formation fly? Because air-to-air refueling starts with formation flying. So It does. It does. And I have to say, having someone come in that has a lot of those skills already, not only does it save us time, but it lets us, you know, we're, we're more like a squadron that's underway, right? We can't teach certain things. I can't teach you how to fly with a real world JTAC or a real world AWACS guy and how to fly the horn at the same time. That's just too much to pile on. But it means so much to us and probably any squadron to get a candidate in who's got those basic skills and you can use them and start working with them day one to bring them into your community and make them a someone who can contribute. Uh, and that's that's one of the biggest things that we talk about is the the stress that it takes off of someone like you or or CEOs of squadrons or whatever that they don't have to go back on their training uh, to to do the basics with someone coming in because they're showing up with a a base knowledge of how to fly as a as a whole where you're not you're not having to go back in and now delay what your intentions are because you have to school someone up now uh that just showed up to your squadron that doesn't know anything at all so like that's that's the huge advantage of this as a whole absolutely um before we close out the love affair between hornet school and one actual is there anything else you guys want to add <laughs> No, okay. Uh, not for, uh, not, I, for, I, not for me. That one blanked my brain out. That was <laughs> that was kind of, kind of funny. Uh, I, I I just want to uh, say a quick thank you. Um, it's been awesome. Um, from the moment you reached out to me and my team, um, to where we're at now, um, I uh, I you know I consider you guys uh the Hornet School's first sponsored love. So um, you'll always hold I'll always be your first. My heart. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, want to, I want to echo what, what Hornet just said, and I, I'm sure the rest of the, the mentor and admin team, you know, is in unison and thanking you because you were a big part of giving us uh, the oomph to keep growing there in the early days. So we appreciate you, buddy. And, yeah, and I'll say if anybody out there's thinking about it, right? Like you're thinking about contact in Hornet School, you're thinking about contact in one actual or a different squadron, like just just do that. Dive in. Yes, Go sir. for it. Even if you're an introvert like I am, just just give it a shot and I think you'll be you'll be pleasantly surprised. Yeah. And uh, I'm another for... introvert. I'm another introvert here. Just do it. <laughs> just do it. <laughs> No way, Grendel, an introvert. No, no chance. I promise you, he's going to have the least number of words said by the time this is done. And, and real quick, uh, let me let me just take the time to uh, say thank you to my entire team, from the admin team, um, you know, to the mentors. 
This was literally a, uh, a thought experiment that started back in April and has turned into this uh, April of last year that has turned into this. So, you know, from the bottom of my heart, uh, thank you, Rudy, who is a, uh, a mentor, a shaker, to is a mentor, and to all the other mentors and admins um, out there. I could not have done this without you. We could not have done this without you. And I, I can't say thank you enough to um, all of you. Um, you know, this isn't a community that I ever wanted uh, to gatekeep information. And you guys go through and you spread the love, you spread the information. Um, so thank you. Thank you. And uh, it, that I think I'm going to head out uh thank you Callie so much and um thank you to all of you guys who have uh shown up but um yeah well you're I welcome really, really appreciate it I appreciate your kind words and you know again if you're out there and you think you can mentor if you want to learn how to fly the hornet uh you know you can be part of this community and keep this stuff going this only happens because of the people that are taking the time to do it so uh, please consider that, and uh, I'm glad you can join. We'll transition to the Wingman Guide, and uh, Hornet, I'm sure we'll be doing something again with you in the future very soon. Absolutely. All right. So, I love you, Hornet. Oh, he's – oh, yes. Um, I, I – it's been a topic – so <laughs> this was inspired because internally – we were trying to get some flight leads up to speed and I was trying to come up with a guide for the flight leads and, and, and how we can approach things and work together. And so we have a night that's separate from our normal flight night. So our flight leads can practice things and, and, you know, make mistakes and ask questions and, you know, just discuss the, the kind of things you have to think about and being ahead of the flight. And so this made me realize that, you know, I could also make a guy that helps our wingman and to think about some things just based on my experience. So what I want to do is I want to set this up so that we discuss these topics and then we'll see what you guys think in the audience. And then it'll be a bit of a competition of you know, what you guys cover, what you think about what I've got, what the audience has to say, and just kind of see what that interaction is and what your thoughts are versus mine. So the very first topic that we'll get into is we're going to get into, um, okay, tonight's format is going to be Cali versus the Hornet School, which I just talked about. But the first thing I want to talk about is the fact that mistakes happen and that the, you know, making a mistake is something that um, I think we all have our own struggles with. And I think we all want to, you know, do well and it's important. But, you know, we're doing hard things and it's not going to be easy. So I think it's important to have the mentality that mistakes happen. What do you guys think about that? I couldn't agree more. <laughs> every <laughs> every uh, flight go has at least one mistake, right? Go ahead, Jake. I think go mistakes, ahead. Sorry. I, I think mistakes, mistakes do happen. And it's all about how you recover from them. And taking also taking ownership of the mistake itself and improving on that and trying not to keep making the same mistake. So learning from your mistakes? That and you know, you take ownership of it. Like you're not you're not putting pushing blame on the lead or or the environmental aspects of it. Like, okay, you know what? I take that's on me. I'll I'll fix it from there and then you just move forward from there. I'm glad that transitioned back into DCS. I thought we were talking about the first like 36 years of my life for a second there. <laughs> I'm vaguely worried. <laughs> no, it's, it, he brings up a good point though, like that rolling with the punches aspect too of like, you know, you're going to get up and you're in the middle of, you know, maybe doing something complicated and oops, we put in a waypoint wrong or, you know, Whatever it is, it's just how you then deal with it in the moment of, okay, here's our situation. What tools do we have to fix it? And then move on. And, you know, at the end of the day, how well did we do after that mistake, really? So don't let 
your mistakes get in, interrupt your decision cycle and your focus. Exactly. Yeah, because otherwise you're going to lose, like, that helmet fire is going to start real quick if you start focusing on little mistakes. Like, we've all done it. You make one mistake, you start focusing on it, and the next thing you know, because everything's happening so dang fast, there's two mistakes, and now three, and then it just starts compounding. Yeah, you, you just know, get farther quick. and farther and farther behind the jet. <laughs> You spend exactly. a lot of dollars trying to recover from a mistake if you keep hampering on it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the, the point is, is, you know, not to, you know, interrupt your hit me thing, but please don't hit me in a mission. Um, but if you don't hit me, uh, if you don't shoot me down, if you don't blow up the the good guys, if you don't crash into another flight, um, you know, there's a lot of mistakes we can recover from. I've seen very few mistakes that were detrimental to um, the entire mission. And, you know, we're going to kill everyone's evening. What is detrimental is if you start going down that path and it's easy. Um, I competed in sports. I, I drove race cars. I've ridden bicycles and raced, you know, other people in a road bike. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of different competitive things. And there was a growth point for me in doing those things where I just had to get in my mind um, the mentality that all I can do is focus on what I'm doing, apply the skills the best I have, and stay in the moment. Because when I got out of the moment, when I started making mistakes, I started going backwards. And then my my mentality was going the wrong way, and it escalated into more problems. And, you know, I would just end up in this negative loop that didn't didn't help anything. And I found that the more I stayed calm, the more I focused on that, the more I closed in on the details. Like around here, for instance, when I fly by the carrier in case one in the 2000 feet in low holding, there are specific things I do on the five mile scale. I have the course line on BRC and I put my left wing tip at the five mile scale on that line. Why? So that when I roll out and try to get to the commence point, I'm starting from the same point every time. Now there could be different crosswinds or whatever, but I'm, I'm using a technique to set myself up for the next thing. And I have all these little skills I've built. So I try to focus on those things and focus on the task at hand and the skills I need. And I'll beat myself up and confess my sins in a debrief. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah, sometimes you gotta like, you know, I'd say another thing about being a, a wing and a relatively new one at that is like, to Shaker's point about you want to fix the mistakes, and sometimes the shortest route to fixing the mistake is is asking for help, right? And like I flying with one actual, you know, getting to know these guys, I've kind of come to the conclusion of like, you know, if they tell me to do something or I realize I've made some mistake, like if I don't think I can figure that out myself in the space of the next fifteen seconds, then it's better to just ask because I can I can go to Cali or Grindle with a small mistake or I can go to Cali and Grindle with a dumpster fire because I I let it get out of hand before I ask somebody about it. You're stealing all of my wingman guides. Stop it. I'm just kidding. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're going to get into the... <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else you guys want to add before we go into what my personal thoughts were ahead of time? No, I don't want to. I don't want to steal it. <laughs> you can steal all you want. No, it's good. I actually prefer you steal it. I'm just going to give no. you some crap. Nothing for me. Nothing for me. No, I don't want to thunderstrike anything. So, all right, <laughs> let's go into my first thought I had individually. So, as I discussed, an athletic or mental reset. Right. Um, actually, I'm going to turn off this overlay a second because it's getting in the way. Uh, there we go. Um, mm -hmm. So an athletic or a mental reset, forgive yourself for mistakes. So, you know, you can see an athlete get upset or mad or have an issue and maybe they throw their helmet or something. But by the time the next play comes, they've forgiven themselves. They're moving on because they know they can't get in that negative leap. Or at least hopefully they've learned that level if they're on a professional level. Any extra thoughts on that from you guys? That's how I was coached as a little kid was there was no last play. Right. You know, Forget it. it. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Like who cares? Go out, do your job. Yeah. So same thing with this, you know, you make these mistakes, whatever it is, correct as quick as you can. 
and don't you know i loved your your automotive thing because i do a lot of like sim racing it's the same thing though it's if you hit a turn and it's just crap i could sit there and spend the next four turns thinking about how you know turn eight was just total shit and i should you know really focus on that or i could just be in the moment and focus on turns nine ten eleven twelve you know because otherwise the rest of my turns are going to start going to crap too like you have to stay in that moment otherwise yeah you like you're saying too with the the concentration dollars your brain can only do so much in a night and if you're going to devote 20 percent of your brain to thinking about <clears throat> that one moment 15 minutes ago when you made a mistake what good is it going to do you in an hour you got to control the narrative your mind will drive you crazy with stupid random despair your your mind hates you right that's what's very apparent <laughs> right i mean i don't know if your mind hates you as much as mine hates me apparently but you you got to flip the script on that narrative and think positive. Hey, I'm doing a good job. Or, you know, I even got the point of, I'm just going to follow this guy in a car. I can't figure out what he's doing. I'm going to study him. I'm going to follow his line and I'm going to learn something and, and make this into a positive, even if I can't pass him or beat him. Right. You got to, you got to control the narrative. No, totally. Like your brain is, like you said, your worst enemy in this kind of stuff. I tell people in the early stages of training, like, 50% of this game is mental. Like you've already psyched yourself up to a point of how much you need to learn and all this stuff that mentally you got to get over that hump now and get your confidence back. Cause otherwise you won't go anywhere. Yeah. And dog in here is mentioning that, you know, the little voices, um, within, you know, they, they, uh, <laughs> so tough, man, you know, you got to let them go. Like he's saying, and it's difficult and, you know, even uh, Brent here is talking about Shaker, trying to make him understand that for the first time and still struggling. I mean, there are nights where I get upset with myself and, you know, I, I'm not saying I have this mastered. It's a, it's something you have to constantly work on. But I think the important thing is, is like I have here in this next thing, don't dwell on the mistakes, focus on the next task. So forget it. Mm -hmm. What's the next task I've got to do in this mission, in this flight, or really anything that you're doing, right? Focus on the next task thing you have to do uh any other thoughts on that before we move on to the next one nope that's solid solid dcs and life advice <laughs> well this is a combination of where this comes from uh so the last one on this is attitude your attitude is everything right? If you can control how you feel about it, if you can forgive yourself and move on, you can have a positive attitude. And that carries on to, you know, uh, when I was racing, m one of my teammates was just super negative on certain things. And I had to pull him aside one day. I'm like, look, dude, you need to park that crap. And you need to just tell me something positive in my ear. In fact, um, small sim racing story, I was racing at a very high level with a sim race. We were doing some off stuff on uh, the dirt in a different series. And I actually had a professional NASCAR driver who's actually from the local area, but um, I only met him online, funny enough. He was doing spotting for me. So he was telling me what was going on. And when I was clear and, you know, tell me I'm gaining on the car in front of me and I'm, I'm leaving the car I just passed and... I, I had never experienced that before where someone was like actively motivating me and trying to pump me up. And I was so motivated by the time we were done with that little 20 lap hot race, I was probably in the best mental state I could be in. And he put me there and we talked about it afterwards. He says, yep, that's what they do on the radio. They got to get everything out of you. They're going to pump you up. No matter what happens, they're going to say something positive. So I really can't stress enough that attitude is absolutely everything. Totally. I think for both like wing or for the lead and wing, like both need to stay positive with each other. Cause like, it's easy when both guys or one guy's having a bad night, you know, making a bunch of mistakes. Other guy can start getting frustrated, you know, whatever the case may be. But just like you're saying, if you can both stay in that like positive mental space, stay on that task at hand, don't be sitting there worrying about the dumb crap you did, you know, five minutes ago, you can always salvage a flight. Like worst case, as long as you both go back and land together, you're, you're good. 
You know, the funniest thing is, <clears throat> I've had flights where I've made tons of mistakes. My wingman had no idea. <laughs> they didn't know. I did that one night. I think it was the Shaker here, actually. We all, uh, and there was a, maybe Rudy was there. There was a few of us one night. We all went in uh, as a four ship back to the boat. And I hadn't flown in a few days. And I was just kind of kicking the rust off my boots and everything. And I was sitting there being overly critical of myself. You know, I'm sitting like, oh, I was this, I was this, I was that. And I think the Shaker was just like, dude, I haven't noticed a single thing because I've just been looking at that sidewinder on the side of your jet this entire time. So we could be 500 feet off from where we're supposed <laughs> to be. And I have no clue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, awesome. I'm talking about positivity. You know, Rudy, Fett, flying with both you guys, like not having the positivity is is one thing that I always try to put into everyone I'm flying with student, not student doesn't matter. Like, you know, we're good. Don't worry. Like we're good. Like we will, we'll do whatever we got to do to make sure that whatever direction we're flying, we'll, we'll get there. But if there's a mistake, we're, we'll, we'll correct it. No big deal. And like, you know, Fett was like, well, you're better off the wing than I am. And I'm like, dude, you're good. Don't worry about it. Like you're, you're giving your, you're not giving yourself enough credit. And, and like me looking from the outside perspective at him, like he's so hard on himself where you, it looks perfect, but we're just, we're critical. And that it kind of takes our attitude in the dumps a little bit. And it's just, it, it's okay to be critical of yourself, but at the same time, like, give yourself some some slack at the same time. So you know how some things are a gift and a curse at the same time? Hey, yes. So that self-critical self-doubt in your mind, I learned, turn that into a little bit of self-evaluation, but don't let it beat you up, right? Don't let it, don't let it tear you down. Use that as the information you need to think about and the input from other people to balance it out so that you don't drive yourself absolutely crazy. Cause I, I went down some pretty negative hard paths and it took me a minute to get there. But once I did, I realized it and everything got easier. You know, I try to stay in that mindset. It's a challenge. I mean, that's, that's why kind of sports psychologists, people exist, right? It <laughs> can be a challenge to do this sort of thing. I have a, an author that I like that often says that uh, to a first approximation, wisdom is nothing more than the capacity to take your own good advice. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah. hard to do, right? Like we give good advice to our to our friends, and then we get it in our own head about a situation that's exactly the same thing, and we're we're beating ourselves up about it. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. No, I mean I get it. You just uh, what's that song? Was it the Eagles that had that song? Don't let the sound of your own wheels drive you crazy. That is indeed the Eagles. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think of that song sometimes just because I'm like, yeah, yeah, all right. I got to remember. That's a good tune. I don't, I don't care how many people hate the Eagles. Yeah, I, I, I just that song, right? Like, I don't say I hate it, but anyhow, um, yes, positive reinforcement is key. All right, let's move on. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, the best pilots fly regularly and learn from their mistakes. Pretty basic, right? all about stick time yep your skills come from the time you put in not the equipment you fly with right so oh i'm sorry fly consistently i just screwed up and went this in reverse order <laughs> i didn't realize i'd moved on oh man so uh yes uh so we we will go back through this but I think, um, Rudy, you said you put in consistency when you were in Hornet school. You put in consistency here. You're definitely on par with people who are very successful right away. And I think that's very important because I don't think you can learn uh, flying it once a week and trying to apply to it just too much. No, I, I try to, um, even with little time, family stuff, et cetera, I try to, you know, fly form off an AI, hit the tanker and do a case one. Um, every day if I can. That's what I did. One great thing about the Hornet school and Rudy, you just hit on it is about time and time management with work, family stuff. 
and and partially a lot of it actually Callie thanks to you and the explosion is that there's people in the server from all over the world and there's people on all different times so like for me if if I'm on in the middle of the night there's usually someone on where I can fly with help teach do something and you can find the time if you're willing to do that and 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 getting that seat extra stick time that you're looking for uh to try and work around your your normal life if per se yeah really i've noticed that a 24-hour community at this point like there's uh, like every time i wake up in the morning i have to catch up on eight hours of messages from people <laughs> here in india and australia and europe no that's awesome because i have sometimes i suffer from insomnia and i see people in there all the time oh always yeah there's Same. there's always somebody in there all right. Yeah, it's crazy to see. It was never like this when we first started, and to see it just like always buzzing is super cool. No, I'm I'm super thrilled with the community's response, and so I'm very happy that people find it helpful. And I think Rudy's an example of where it can go for you. Um, so your skills come from the time you put in, not the equipment you fly with. What do you guys think about that? I think I have a Thrustmaster T sixteen thousand, and um, I feel like I'm doing okay with it. So <laughs> I, I agree completely. You know, we had this I'm, discussion. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. lead. I'll, I'll I'll lead you into this for you. So we've had this discussion with people in the chats in in our Discord about equipment, and um, a lot of it is learn how to fly, learn how to fly the right way. Use what you have, and if you decide to upgrade in the future, it'll just make you that much better with the ability to do the extra little bit you can with the other equipment that's, I guess, a little bit better per se or more precise. But if you can fly with the basic stuff and fly the right way, upgrading your stuff It'll help you. It's a tool just like anything, but it's not the end all be all. No. And, you know, I couldn't even tell you that Fett was flying or that Rudy was flying with the lowest equipment because he flies just fine. Um, you know, the one the one area that I will probably say helps you is if you have the right number of peripherals or hat switches so you can do more things without clicking the mouse, that makes it easier and, and reduces your time to do those things. But short of that, the actual raw skills are going to come from your time. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. Like, it, I've, I have got all my chops on my Logitech X56, you know, entry-level gear, and, you know, like Shaker was saying, you know, I'm pretty hard on myself when it comes to shit like formation flying. You know, I want to get way better at it. And uh, I was still, I could still do it. You know what I mean? But, like, I always felt like I could be better. I could be better. It, I will say making the upgrade in your equipment, like, if you're already, like, proficient, you'll see a change. It's just like Shaker was saying. It's just, like, it's another tool. It's it's you know, go back to car racing, you know, it's it, difference between racing a Toyota Celica and, you know, a Lexus, you know, oh. there, there's going to be a difference there. You know, uh, I was a wheel tester for sim racing for a long time. And I'll tell you one thing that makes a difference. What's that? It's not your wheel. It's your brakes. <laughs> <laughs> That's valid, but no, it, but it, it's, it's going to be that little extra, tool in your pocket like we always talk about the school of like you know try to get as many tools in your tool bag as possible that can potentially be one but don't ever think that because you have like some low end stick that you can't do this uh hornet who you left us earlier he flies with the x56 as well with like shoelaces holding it together his is He's well, got and, a crazy little setup, and, and he, he flies f- Blue Angels. Yeah, and he fly. I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen his video, but he flies amazing. Like, I'm like, I'm not going to fly like that. I don't have time to learn quite that, but it's impressive. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, don't ever think that your equipment is holding you back in some way because it's it's not. It's uh, it, it it's again, it will help you. But again, if you don't know how to use it, what good is it? None. 
Yep. None. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, it's an easy trap to fall into when you're frustrated, right? Like I, I did it when I was trying to learn how to tank and it was, it was so hard and just can't get the basket and can't hold the basket. And it's like, oh, it's a stick. The stick's garbage, man. It's a hundred bucks. Like it's terrible, but it, it wasn't the stick. It's just as well, it was, but it's stick time, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think the worst thing about that one is the throttle, isn't it? Kind of, it's really loose, doesn't give you a lot of precision. Uh, you can do some work with it. I mean, I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not sponsored by Thrustmaster. I'm not trying to go out and buy a Thrustmaster. <laughs> Liar! <laughs> Liar! If you, if you can afford something better than this, then please, please do that. But you can work with it. You, you can tweak it a little bit. I, I've gotten quite used to it. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Um, it really it takes the time and dedication and consistency to improve. Uh, if you don't do those things, you, I've seen people come on an irregular basis. Um, I've seen people who put in a, a period of time, and then they stop for a while and come back, and they won't maintain that skill level. Um, I think that's why they have recency and you know, they have times in the real uh, military for how long, you know, till you've done something until it expires. But if you want to improve, you got to do it regularly and you got to have the dedication. And, you know, that's really up to you. If, uh, you know, that's what you want to do with DCS. If you want to take it to a higher level, if you're happy just doing something at a lower level and it's your hobby, I'm never going to judge. But I'm talking from the perspective of someone who's running a group that's trying to fly at a high level and what that takes. I think that's true, but I think I think it's also important to point out that it doesn't it doesn't have to be tons of time at any one moment, right? And and that's what I always try to stress to students. Like if you're trying to learn how to tank, for example, like just put in fifteen minutes a day. Like right. like set up a set up a training mission that starts you like a you know, a mile or two hundred two miles, not two hundred mile or two miles behind the tanker. And give it a shot. Set it to set it, literally set a timer. Give it fifteen minutes and just just work with it. You know, win, lose, or draw. You, you do that, and when the fifteen minutes is up, you can you can call it and go on with your day. And, and if you do that every day, it, it's going to lead to noticeable improvement really quickly. I share, and maybe I should <clears throat> just share it with the community. I have an air start form flying and an air start um, error refueling, where you can pick be behind any of the three tankers. And you just go work on that skill. You know, maybe that's all you have time for. Go work on that one thing and get that one thing down for the 15, 20 minutes, whatever you've got. And that's going to help you. Yeah. And I, I have lots of those. I have lots of those too. And I think I, I think I flew your air start form flying thing the other night, although it was quite scary to do with four people in that particular <laughs> setup. Um, but you know, the, the, that's what it, that's what it does. Yep. I think to add to this with taking the time, dedication, and consistency, it's challenging yourself and holding yourself to that challenge with whatever it, it whatever it is. Like, I'm going to challenge myself to be the best the best pilot I can be, and this is what it's going to take, and I'm going to hold myself to that and actually sticking with it which leads into the dedication and consistency part of it. But it's actually like for me starting DCS, like I wanted to challenge myself to learn something new. It's not a game where you, you could just get in and go and be good at it. You, you have, you have to say I'm, I'm challenging myself to learn and put the effort into, into doing this and, and giving it all I got and just, seeing where the results take me. Absolutely. You have to have that goal in mind, right? Um, yeah, without, without a goal in, in this, like you're, you're kind of just floating around. There's, there's gotta be, there's gotta be goals. Like you're just saying, there needs to be a goal in mind. Little by little set goals, make another goal. You keep hitting that and then just keep advancing yourself further and further. Absolutely. So let's move on to the next one, which is what are your guys' thoughts on quality versus quantity of flight hours? Ooh, that's a tough one for me. Like, I want to say quality, you know, like my knee jerk reactions to say, like, get 
good solid if you're only going to get to fly for 30 minutes a day you know like be the most productive you can be but at the same time like i want to say like just have fun in the jet too like don't don't burn yourself with trying to focus on every little thing like you got to just sometimes go have some fun enjoy some just flight time you don't always have to be working on something like sometimes you can just relax and go for a flight you know so that may not necessarily be the most quality time but you're definitely getting some good quantity time in there you said some words that i don't understand there (laughs) words words like what you said something about uh not working hard all the time i don't i don't understand what that means (laughs) the same thing but i was like (laughs) My favorite thing to introduce people to is night flight because for me, that's like, that is the only time I ever really feel like I get to like relax in the jet. I love nothing more than if I have like an hour to kill end of the night, you know, kids in bed or something, pop a headphone in, throw my headphones on and go for a little hour, hour and a half flight, you know, go do something, you don't have to necessarily do nothing, but you know, don't make it some crazy thing. Just, Go enjoy the the this moon and the the clouds and enjoy DCS. I agree with that. My my answer to this question is yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. And so that's that's perfect because I didn't put the quantity and have fun aspect in here because my brain doesn't work that way. To me, <laughs> fun is building skills. I know not everyone thinks that way. But I will go and work on the same stupid thing over and over again because I enjoy having a skill and being able to apply it. But I'm also a little bit, you know, psychotic that way because my goals are maybe different. But you should enjoy the game you want and do what you want to do. Yeah, Absolutely. the only the only caution I would offer on the the quantity side is like, you know, there there are times when it's obviously obvious you're getting into like diminishing returns. Right. You know, if you're getting really, if you're getting really frustrated and pissed off with something, then it's, it's time to just, just hang it up, you know, walk away for, you know, a few minutes, a few hours, a few days, come back, try it again. You want to know some science behind that? Sure. I, I, I'm a, I'm a science dude. So when they have studied people trying to learn something and they map their mind while they're sleeping, one of the things that they postulate is that your mind is taking that skill you tried to learn and sort of rewiring your system to be able to perform that skill. And people usually improve from the first day to the second day and each day more so after they sleep and their mind is working out how the body can mechanically perform that motion. So you're right. If you hit a dead zone or you're getting a diminishing return, um, Maybe you have fatigue going on or you have some other issues. Um, the the thing to do is to take a break and to focus on, you know, recovery and let and let your body do the work that you've already put in. It's funny when we teach people to air to air refuel, it's like clockwork. Right at about 30 minutes of them, and not to say every student, you know, some people get up and they they have better luck than others, but if they're like me, first 30 minutes they're just sitting there, you know oscillating trying to stab at that basket you know having a hell of a time and at about 30 minutes you know they start to maybe hone in a little bit they start to kind of get their wits about them by 45 minutes they're completely off the rails and we pretty much are like all right we've taught you everything you're going to learn today because after 45 minutes they're never going to regain it's (laughs) at that point they're frustrated they're you know every negative thing you can think about DCS is going through their head. So cut it short on ones like that. <laughs> For sure. And I that... come up... Sorry, go ahead, Kelly. No, go ahead, Shaker. I, I kind of came up with this little plan a while back where uh, it might be the navigation flight or refueling or something like that, where it, it becomes kind of boring for them because uh, in the navigation one, you're just flying, you know, waypoints and after adding them in and everything. So what I've done a little bit to kind of spice things up and have them en- enjoy it is, you know, towards the end of it, I'll say, 
we'll get by like some mountains or something. I'll be like, all right, man, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put the tack in in for back for the airfield and we'll go like rip through the canyons as fast as we can and, 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 and kind of like decompress a little bit and fly through there. You know, we're not form flight. It's just ripping through and it, it takes it from that total concentration phase of trying to get gas or the monotony of, of flying waypoint to waypoint where now we're doing something fun and they'll get back on the ground and be like, dude, that was awesome. Like, I really enjoyed that because it was like a switch for those guys. Yeah. We had a guy the other night that was struggling with form flying and um, he's newer and you know, he's got a lot of knowledge about the jet, but he doesn't have a lot of squadron knowledge. And I normally would probably just send this guy to Hornet school. And I think he's actually going through Hornet school now, but he is you, now, yeah, he is. Okay. And so his improvement was great, but that night he had just said, man, I'm just so frustrated. And so we just switched to, you know, shooting each other down for a minute. <laughs> I was telling students like same thing, just like Shaker was saying, we go out and do something hard. Like my Hornet said it to me and I always say it's the students just like, all right, dude, just go ahead and fly it like a fighter jet for a little while. Cause then all of a sudden, you know, it's just permission. Cause they're, they're so worried about, you know, AOA and overhead, you know, all the procedurals we're doing. Yeah, once you let them just like take the leash off for ten minutes and just go haul ass, like it's just like it totally flips their mood back around. Yeah, and you know that is part of the um, mentality of keeping people's focus, right? So what I put down was um, uh, nothing because I wanted it to be a free discussion. And I think you guys brought up some of the greatest points I could think of. I think the only thing I would add is what I mean by quality is building skills. What I mean by quantity is just flying randomly. And, you know, both can be fun. You got to do what's right for you and balance those out. Like you talked about the task versus fun kind of balance. Absolutely. Uh, number four. And I think we're moving farther away from Hornet school here. Um, on this one, and we're moving more into flying with a squadron and probably a dangerous AO, but number four is always protect yourself. I think that's totally valid. Like, you, you if you're not, your situational awareness isn't very good. And if your situational, situational awareness isn't very good, what good are you right now in the fight overall? Yeah, I mean, if you, I can't defend a missile for you, right? Missiles coming Very inbound. True. You got to take care of that, whether it's a SAM I mean, site. You, you could dive in front, take one for the T, but you know. I see. Your expectations of me are high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's true. Even if, you know, even if that extends to the point of being overly cautious, which obviously we I'm using the term overly, which implies that's not a good thing either, but there's certainly absolutely nothing that your flight gains from your jet exploding. No. Right? Like that's just, that's a full loss on, on every level. Um, so even if you're being a little overcautious trying to, you know, protect yourself, then like that's, that's better than being a cowboy and ended up a fireball. Yeah. And the point I wanted to make was you're responsible for your jet, right? And that you need to take care of that jet. And though you might be a wingman, you need to do the things that are going to keep you safe. And, you know, that requires some understanding, like you said, of the situation you're in. Um, and so I think it's very important to recognize that. And that, you know, at the end of the day, you're still the captain of your jet and your plane, right? I'm the captain now. <laughs> Hey, I'll make you a flight lead any day you want, brother. I will just fly wing. I'll let you make all the decisions. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> the stress also, is even real. in terms of protecting yourself, like if you're flying formation, especially in the Hornet School, we put students as leads once in a while just to give them our point of view. Um, as a wing, they might they might do something that's unexpected and you got to be ready for it. So, you know, everyone needs to protect themselves and 
you know, focus on the situational awareness, like Fett said. And if you if you don't have that situational awareness, you know, you could take yourself and the rest of the flight out potentially if if you don't have that. Absolutely. And and I'm glad you mentioned that and that you do that because being a flight lead is a whole different mentality with a whole other set of skills and responsibilities. And so I think it helps to see that. I think it helps to go in and have to lead comms and do certain things to just give you a deeper perspective. Yeah, it opens up your eyes as a wing, you know, when you're forced to lead once in a while, because this way you're seeing both sides of, of the fence and you, you understand as a wing now why leads are doing what they're doing. Well, and you are also stealing a future topic. We're going to talk about how to not be an extra burden on your flight lead and how to think of what he needs, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely, 100%. That's uh, always my biggest worry. Right. How to anticipate what their needs are and, and be a contributor to the mission, not a draw on the flight lead. And that's a... That's a much deeper topic with a lot of stuff in there and, you know, after you get used to some of these other things. But we'll move on to the one that Rudy stole from me, and that is speak up. Right? If you're lost, if you don't know what's going on, get on the radio and start asking questions. What's been your guys' experience with that stuff? Like I said, I, I literally, I literally have like a rule that I like a question I ask myself quickly. Can I figure this out myself in the next ten seconds? If I think the answer to that is no, I'm I'm gonna ask. And in go ahead, I've been guilty of the I was, I've been guilty of the exact opposite where I'll you know I'm too prideful, so I'll sit there and be like, okay, what's this problem? I kind of have a base idea of how to figure this out. I can, I can figure this out. And then you struggle with it for a minute before you finally, you know, find the right knee board that had the information, you whatever it is, you know, and then next thing you know, you're a minute behind everyone else. When in reality, you could have just easily just popped on minutes and just been like, Hey, what was the tack in number again? You know, and it would have been solved in two seconds, but like we we're saying, I don't want to be the draw on the mission. You know, this guy is probably trying to put in waypoints and whatever else. I don't want to bother him for a tack and number that I should know anyway. But don't be afraid to speak up. Is the is the point of that? Is because uh, if you don't, you're gonna sit there and waste time. Well, this research group that I worked with, we always used to say that we operated on the pride free, like in the pride free zone, because like just. Don't waste time, right? Don't make things difficult for other people. If you've got a question, just just put it out there. It's it's gonna save everybody's you think sometimes you think you're saving people's time by trying to solve something yourself, but you're actually just kind of wasting it with foresight because you're gonna have a bigger problem later. Man, you're stealing what we're getting to next. I love it. Uh, no, um, this was firm this was firmly in this one. No, I no no no. It's it's actually one of the things I put in here for this. I love it. Um I want to. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Part of speaking up too also is, you know, everybody in here has a as a wealth of knowledge, you know, as experienced or as basic as it is, and you have to have a mentality also that I'm I'm always willing to learn and be a student, not not just a teacher. So if if you have the mentality of like, oh, well, I'm a I'm a mentor or I'm a, a teacher, I can't ask that question, then you're not going to speak up. And that's, it's just a mentality that you got to throw in the garbage because, you know, you, you need to be humble to be a, a good lead or a good wing at the same time. And it's kind of interesting because at one actual, there, there's two big things that I, I think are kind of cornerstones and, one is, in a debrief, just confess your sins. We're going to find out anyways, right? And you're not going to learn if you don't. And ask in real time. If you don't know, ask. Because I think the first thing I'm going to show here in my thoughts was, if you get behind the situ- yeah, if you get behind the situation, if you don't understand something, ask. Don't let it snowball into a bigger problem later. And that's exactly what happens, right? You you missed part of the grid or you didn't get certain a certain piece of information. So now your wingman or your flight lead is on 
one um, you know, task and you're a couple tasks behind and it's only going to get bigger as we go to do an attack phase or now we're trying to land and that that thing you lost is now going to be exposed, it's going to be a problem. And if we had a sequential ta attack going on, uh, if you've got other jets landing behind you and you're out of the pattern, all these things snowball into a bigger thing. So don't let it happen. And I love what you said about the, you know, always learn mentality. I'm always the first to confess my sins. I always want to learn. I always want input. I always ask, what could I have done better? What went right? What went wrong? Because, man, I, I'm trying to figure this stuff out. I haven't been through uh, a military school. I haven't flown with a squadron with mentors and stuff, you know, in the real world. So I want that feedback. I want to learn and improve. Yeah, absolutely. And like, you know, post-flight, too is where tack view and debriefs always are uh, it's the most essential thing that you can do to help everybody involved i kind of get an enjoyment out of the debrief conf confession for some reason i just kind of enjoy rolling in there and being like all right guys here's a list of everything i sucked out on that flight <laughs> Well, it helps me remember too, right? Like I'm trying to remember all these things in a debrief. And so if you mention it, it helps us give a more complete debrief. Yeah. It's just, I don't know. It's kind of entertaining when you, when you, when you phrase it that way, just like, just put it together an exhaustive list of all the ways in which you were terrible that time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then tell everyone in the group, shred your yes. dignity and then disconnect. Good night. <laughs> exactly. They, they, they can't give you they can't give you a bunch of grief about it if you bring it up first. See, that's the best thing is you, you, it's almost like a defense, right? You're like, Hey, I screwed this up and that up and this up. And now nobody wants to add to it. <laughs> yeah. You guys didn't, you guys didn't even see how bad I was. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> you can hide it with your confessions. I love it. I actually have comment. Go for it. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. You're there. No. Uh, uh, what actually helped me with speaking up is, when I first started, I was kind of nervous about talking to our in real life JTACs because they're the real deal. Um, but it was one of them who uh, talked to me more about that. And they actually, or he actually told me um, <laughs> in real life, they just because in order to fly a Hornet or any multi role jet, that's not specific to the, that's not a specific cast platform jet. The real world pilots don't always know what they're doing around the CAS airspace either. So they're pretty new to it too. So like Callie has always said, our JTACs want positive reps. And that involves or that includes people who are also not sure what to say on the radio. Or maybe they're talking with someone where English is not their primary language. So it's it's you know, there's that. So once a JTAC told me. Don't worry about fumbling on the radio. You know, if you don't understand something, speak up because this happens in real life all the time. It's a team. It's a team effort. Yep. And and I'm glad you brought that up, Grendel, because well, for some reason my brain thought that all, everyone who flies CAS as a pilot, they're just I'm not saying. I mean, they're professionals, of course, but they don't do it all the time, day in and day out. They they do so many other things. That, you know, we're not even doing so. Right. And, and it's funny, we, we had a, um, a guy who's going through military flight school right now, and he's flying one of the trainer jets with a T in front of it. And uh, it's funny because, you know, he didn't mention CAS or how cool it was or how fast the jet is or that he was enjoying himself. He literally said, I'm trying to learn how to not kill myself. Like that was his absolute focus. <laughs> so, yeah. Other things to focus on. Uh, along with that, let's talk about the concept of slowing down, right? You guys had experience trying to slow situations down that are getting ahead of you and out of control? Too many yeah, to mention. And, and, that, and that's part of recovering from any mistakes. If you find yourself behind the jet, try to slow slow yourself down in your thought process to make things more clear for yourself to get ahead of where you're currently at. I have said to a lot of wingmen, 
uh, who were overwhelmed because again, we are task saturation heavy. We are comms heavy. And I'll be like, Hey, just push out to this airspace. Cause I know they know how to do airspace awareness and fly in a certain spot, get your switches together, get your stuff going, and then let's reset and come back in. Right. Give them a moment to, you know, not be overwhelmed get their mindset back in the right situation and, and go. There's very few times where you can't take a moment to slow things down. Yeah. It's kind of like with the, like I was telling you guys with the fam flight the other night, like in the first fam flight, you'd be like, okay, I have a, I have a grid when you're ready. And I would be like, okay, I'm ready. Um, but I wasn't actually ready <laughs> for it. Um, and it was only in the most recent fam flight that, you know, the person controlling the airspace would be like, I have a grid when you're ready. And I would kind of, I would slow it down. Right. And I'd say, okay, like I'm going to make sure my stuff is set. Like make sure I'm not heading off in the wrong direction, wrong speed, losing altitude, get my pen and paper and then say, okay, send it. Right. And just like some, and you can inject some intentional slowdown. Like you said, most of the time, right. Sometimes you can't, but a lot of time it's, you know, if it's, if it, if you need an extra five seconds to get actually ready for something, it seems like that's usually permissible. And it's usually not going to affect something. It's usually going to be better to, you know, measure twice and cut once because that way you're not, you know, dropping the bomb on the wrong space. And, you know, it's it's hard when you haven't built the internal kind of process for taking all this information in. And I know sometimes I read grids very fast um, just because it's in my cycle, I know how I want to read it. I know what I'm going to do, but if you slow down or say repeat to make sure you get the grid right versus dropping or versus putting your sensor on the wrong thing and telling me you have contact and we're not looking at the right thing and we try to correlate versus the time it takes to get the right grid. I mean, it's so much faster to just fix the problem and slow it down. Absolutely. Yeah. Slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Yep. yep. So my independent thoughts was give yourself time and space to be successful. Don't force yourself into time compression. And I was very happy the other day, uh, Grendel was leading a flight back on the fam flight and we'd split up uh, the flight because uh, I can't remember exactly why we did that. But he even mentioned the debrief. The reason I didn't turn straight into the airport and I did this loop to go around was to give him and his flight, I'm guessing, time to descend and get online and have a smooth entry. Is that what your thought was there, Grendel? We weren't joined up yet. And I could have forced uh, it, but I'm like, I'm not going to force it. Right. There's no need to. So I said, I'm just going to do a quick orbit, let everybody come in, and then we'll go in together. Because I think these things build on each other. So let's take an example of a flight. You're in a flight. And you've made a couple mistakes and now you're not focused. And then you miss some information. You don't have the right grid and the guys are going to attack and now it gets exposed and you're trying to get on the sensor and get in the airspace you're supposed to be at the same time and trying to ask questions and other guys are, you know, about to do their attack run and you are just got so many things slapping you in the face at one time because you weren't ahead of the situation and you're trying to catch up. So when time compression hits and you didn't need it to, and it was preventable, that's the point I'm trying to make is step back, be humble, uh, take your mistakes like a man and just be involved with the team as a team. Any other thoughts on that? You know, there, especially in the Hornet school or a lot of times we'll be going, trying to go to a tanker and as a lead, you know, you'll have, you'll have a plan of how to, the best, the best way to get to the tanker and the tanker turns <laughs> or, you know, you're trying to get ready. They're in the echelon, right? A lot of times what I'll do is I'll just take it wide and slowly, slowly go back around after it turns and comes you know, heads back our way when we weren't ready for that, just to not force a crazy turn and then stress out this student who's trying to not screw up and they're already nervous about it already. And instead of, instead of forcing it is just, okay, we're just going to extend out. 
we'll we'll get you on the left side you know once we once we get behind the tanker and then we'll go from there instead of just like you said forcing it and then all of a sudden it turns into a massive helmet fire and then there's mistakes like on top of that i'm glad you said that and man we we are tracking mentally there because one of the first things we do with new flight leads is have them try to intercept the tanker and serendipitously uh, the cloud level with uh, the training map and where the tanker is, you don't always get to see the tanker and it kind of has some issues. So it interrupts their, their cycle of doing it. And uh, it can show uh, or it can force people into time compression if they don't take that time out. So I think that's critical. I think being a good flight lead is a lot of hard work and you got to try to prevent those things for yourself and them. So that's a great example. Thank you for sharing that shaker. Anyone else on this? No, I think, I think it's just great advice. Like just don't, don't push it. Cause otherwise you're going to make mistakes. Like when you try to hurry, when you try to rush through something, that's when you're going to cut a corner. And then just like we keep, you know, hammering on tonight, you make that first mistake and it's uh, downhill from there. Well, and when it gets downhill from there and time compression is at its worst and you are, you know, not comfortable with the situation, number seven is that aborting is okay, right? Is anybody here going to say that aborting is a bad thing? <laughs> nope. I had to do it last night. We were doing a uh, harm seed training with my squadron and it has been a minute since I shot a harm. And with the new throttle and everything, you know, where my key binds are, just my brain was not remembering the steps right. And uh, I waited for my first pass, had the trouble, and rather than sit there and be like, well, I'll get this at the last second, you know, abort that run, just turn out. Then, like we talked about earlier, I went right on the radios. Hey, what am I doing wrong? In a minute, well, like, I know I'm missing something basic here, and you know, Sure as hell, I, I wasn't doing the uh, cage on cage button. Just completely was slipping my mind to, to do that at the end. <laughs> oh, to but, select uh, the the emitter. Yeah. Yep. 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 You know, simple little step, but again, you know, my muscle memory's different now with this new throttle and everything. Get my brain wrapped back around it, and uh, but yeah, there was nothing wrong with just taking that extra. You know, at the end of the day, four or five minutes maybe to turn out, reassess, get set back up and then set myself up for success on the second run, which, you know, worked out. I got my target. And that, I mean, I know we keep saying kind of the same thing, but <laughs> it's so critical. And I think it's, it's important to have a guide like this for people to understand where these things come from. And, you know, this is all from my lessons of trying to lead flights and learn this stuff. I'm glad that you've had mutual experiences because sometimes I feel alone and trying to figure this out. I've got some good squad lead or flight leads and people, but oftentimes you're alone in that jet trying to do this. So I hope this resonates with other people. <laughs> you no, know, that's so funny you say that because you do, that's the moment you feel alone when you're sitting there flying form, everything's going great. You're on mids talking to your buddies, you know, Hey, you're all like, in the same room basically and then all of a sudden you know it's when you're out in like you know offensive spread you know you're about a mile apart and then you can't figure something out and that all, all of a sudden that isolation like sets in really quick like you really do feel like you're kind of like out there alone for a split second and like we keep saying like most of the times the dudes you're flying with we're all nerds for this stuff like if you ask these people how how the harm shoot most of them want to tell you so ask <laughs> well and in that quiet dark alone moment your mind will tell you how much of a horrible person you are right <laughs> yeah exactly like you should know like, i did last night in that split second you know it's like dude come on you can shoot harms you know how to shoot harms like what are you doing you're having trouble right now and it was just like you know everything we've talked about tonight taking a step back slowing down assessing that situation at hand and i knew what the situation was it was my muscle memory is off i'm so used to doing it with my old controls and how my my fingers would move to do it and now they're different and it just completely threw me for a loop in that you know moment when you're trying to do it so all those things we talked about tonight you know it, it's what helps you overcome those things because otherwise you know me a year ago 
I would have gone into a tight spiral right into the ground, you know, trying to figure this thing out. And instead it was just like, nope, slow down. Okay, here, ask questions, move on, reassess, go again, find success. And then you're buying... Mind... Talk about um, aborting is okay. Like, I think this is a great hit because when these guys are, are, are they're already super nervous about doing their case one quals, they don't lose points or anything when they call their own wave off. So a lot of the times guys are coming in, rolling out into the groove and, you know, their, their rollouts are, aren't great and they're low or they're too high or whatever. Instead of just forcing it in, they'll, we're, we're telling them like, call your own wave off if you have to. Um, but that's part of, it's okay to abort just, go back into the bolter pattern and go around instead of forcing it and then giving yourself uh, your, a bolter where now you're losing points and you're losing a trap in your qual instead of just calling your own wave off and aborting it. And I've never had squadron mates sitting on the deck. We park on cat two, park on cat two and be like, you know, you suck. You aborted. You, you boltered. Everyone's boltered. Everyone's made a mistake. Everyone understands everyone's just trying to be there for you, right? Like <laughs> we've all had that night where we bolt her three times, you know, four times. It's just, it happens to everyone. Uh, we had just the other night, we were doing a, a K3 stuff. And one of our mentors bolted a few times in a row and you could tell he was getting like frustrated with it. Cause he's like, I should be able to do this by now. This is stupid. Well, that's because his mind was saying, you suck. <laughs> exactly and you know we were all sitting there like don't worry dude just go back around like no sweat off. i was lso in that night so i was just like hey no sweat off of my nose man what's five more minutes i'm i'm just sitting here on the deck bring it on back around you know like we're all sitting on the deck we, we want them to to hit their traps and stuff we're not we're not making side bets to see if they're not going to do it we're we're being positive like all right, let's. I want you to do this. I want you to qual. I want you to have a great, a great flight. You know, it's like, and that's the positive outlook on it. And trying to, trying to stop that, that guy from, from getting, you know, down on himself because he boltered once or twice or whatever. It, you know, it's just aborting's okay. But we're we're here for you. We're not here to hurt you at the same time. Yep. And that brings me to the two points I thought about ahead of time. It's better to reset than to force a position or situation that's going to get you into time compression and other issues, right? And, you know, trust your gut. If it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't. You guys ever had that feeling where you knew it wasn't right, you forced it, and yep, it wasn't right? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, yeah, time and space, brother. Time and space. If you think about it, a jet is fast, right? But like uh, when we went from rocks and sticks to, you know, weapons with projectiles, that gave you time and space to not get hit with a rock. And a jet is designed to give you time and space, even though it's really fast and things happen, you have the ability, like I said, in most cases to take that time and space. Yeah, anything, absolutely. Anything else on that before we go to the next one? Not for me. All right, so what are your thoughts on knowing your jet as a good wingman? <laughs> that, this probably should have been number one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, the more confident you are behind the stick and behind, you know, even the most basic of things like just your HSI, how much, you know, work do we do in the HSI on a mission? Being comfortable with these systems, even the most basic ones, is going to give you that upper hand, you know, when your lead calls you out to do something, you know, like offset waypoints. If you know how to do that and quick, boom, you know, you're going to save everyone 30 seconds of having to have it explained to you, which, again, going back to what we did, that's not bad. Nothing wrong with that. But if you can be ahead of the game, why not? Yeah, One of my I favorite things about. This, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rudy. I was just gonna say I I, always, I frequently tell the trainees that the HSI is a shockingly large percentage of flying the Hornet, 
and another very large percentage is the essay page and then there's like a few little bits left over for like you doing pilot things that's, <laughs> that's kind of the thing one of my favorite things about knowing your jet is doing the navigation flight and having them coupled on one of the waypoints and telling them to keep it coupled so knowing what's going to happen when it goes from one waypoint to the other coupled in the sequence when all of a sudden the jet rolls super hard and they're like oh my god what's going on because it's forcing the next waypoint and not just easily going from one to the other so all right well now i know like if i keep this on for now on it's just gonna hammer over to the next waypoint there's also a setting deep, deep in the HSI that will make it make smoother turns in autopilot yes. pilot when it comes up to yeah. waypoints, right? Yep. So it's like, yeah. That's what we were bringing up too. Yeah, it's just, it's, and I didn't know that until uh, somebody at Hornet School taught me that. I was just like, God, why is this thing turned like a maniac every time it's on autopilot? And they're like, well, make it, make it, make it stop. As sexy as the targeting pod is and dropping bombs and all of that, None of that really works well without the HSI page and the SA page. Those are some of the things that distinguish the Hornet as a go-to-war platform that has amazing situational awareness versus some of the generations before it, right? Like, I know some people say, oh, the Hornet's boring to fly. Well, I think it depends on the context you fly it in because you fly it in a, in a context with a lot of things going on and a lot of complexity. The Hornet can make your life a lot easier. Uh, dog says he concurs with you, Fett. <laughs> All right. Um, so I just put down, uh, know how to use all the tools in your jet, uh, air to air and air to ground, just kind of generic, but the more, you know, how to use those tools to your advantage, the better. Um, so this is a very near and dear topic to my heart. And that's being airspace aware and navigate, which we are just talking about with the SA page and the HSI tool. I think we covered that actually pretty well before we got here. Do you guys have more thoughts on this and some experience to share? Well, too many experiences. I don't know where I'd pick one, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, just be aware. I mean, use that SA page. I I put it on my bottom, my AMPCD, just kind of by default. You know, maybe in my flight, I might switch that up here and there depending on what I'm doing, but keep it open because you got to keep your eye on what's going on around you. So here, it doesn't it doesn't move once it's on the MPCD that's it's stuck there and I'm constantly looking out for who's in the area. So the thoughts I had were know where you are, right, which having the HSI page up helps with that. Know where the other flights are. That's your SA page. Know where the threats are. That can be your SA page or getting the grid and entering it in and getting the information in a situation update. Um, you know, mind the hard deck. Obviously, that's, you know, just something you have to know. But also know where your friendlies are. And that's your friendly jets and SAM sites. In an air-to-air -air situation, you can run back to your friendly SAM sites and they can help you because I've had to before. Um <laughs> You guys ever done that? <laughs> right back to I've had the chance, but it's definitely been like, you know, uh, I've ran back to the carrier having people chasing you on like a public server, <laughs> you know, red airs following you. It's like, well, if I get close enough to the carrier, they'll, they'll at least take care of this for me. <laughs> hey, it's a tool in your toolbox, right? Exactly. So jumping a little, little bit here, pushing through these, I wanted to talk about this particular thing here. Um, so this is the HSI page. And down here we have a sequence too, which is a custom sequence. This comes from a document. Um, and I and I got to give a shout out to my guys. A lot of the guys that want actual will see a need for something and they will just jump on it without asking. And it makes it so nice for me to try to keep the train tracks in front of the group and to be able to do podcasts like this and, and other things. Um, and this is something is, you know, which I think you've probably seen this document by now, Rudy, right? The airspace awareness document. Oh yeah. I, I love that doc. Yeah. So that was made without asking. And what this is, is, you know, you can go into the UFC uh, and enter in some waypoints. You can sequence them and it'll put a line for you. And if this was, you know, and 
area that you need to stay on the other side of, right? You need to be uh, west and east, uh, well, actually north of this line. You can say, oh, look, there's the line. I'm north. Uh, you can have another waypoint tells you where your target is or some other information. Using this gives you a ton of information. And in this case, he has the IP. So his initiation point is set up right here. His target is down here and he's here, right? So what does he need to do? He needs to turn, fly here and come down this line. So he has everything he needs right here on the SA page to be aware of the airspace he's supposed to be in and what he needs to do to complete that attack. And in close air support, this is an absolute must if you're going to be airspace aware, not bust your airspace and come in on the attack heading that you were asked to come in on. Is this the tools you guys use? Yeah, very, very similar, if not the same. Yeah. So yeah, it's a must, like you said. Yeah, exactly. So this is, this is a difference in my mind between someone who I can't take on an air to ground mission and someone I can, they can do all the admin skills. They know how to use this worst case scenario. Like I said, I can push them off to a block of space, give them a moment in time, bring them back in and do this. So this is a necessary skill in my opinion. All right, moving on. And this is a topic near and dear to my heart. And we are getting towards the end. There's only a couple more. But that's minimize the extra workload for your flight lead. You guys had people that just drew on you so hard it drained you out? Oh, yeah. And, you know, that's to be expected in the school. And we welcome that, you know, ask questions. But when we're talking about, like, a mission situation, you know, do your best. Like, I'm sure we're doing a briefing beforehand. And, you know, most of the information's in that briefing. You know, keep your pen and paper ready write down the waypoints whatever it is because you don't want to be that guy in the flight asking for every little piece of information that you can't find and i mean again i want to include people to ask and do it but the more you know your jet the more you understand the mission the more you understand the context the more i can use you as an asset versus being a liability Exactly. That, that was just going to say that is, is still, you know, those asking questions is great, but there does come a point where you switch from being that liability to an asset. It's going to be more fun if you're prepared to, right? Like it's not fun if you're going in there, you don't know what you're doing. You have to ask your flight lead like every 10 seconds for information. Um, like we keep talking about, it's okay to do that. If you need it, then, then ask, you know, don't let it become a bigger problem, but, but definitely prep beforehand. Yeah. And, you know, asking one or two little questions to get back on cycle. Hey, no big deal. Constantly in that state. And I constantly have to hand feed. I mean, at the end of the day, there's only so much I can do. And if a radio transmission comes in on primary while I'm doing this with you, now I'm ahead of the situation. I've got working with the JTAC or the, the AWACS controller or whatever it is, right? So you can get me behind by trying to help you at the same time. So ask the questions. Um, and we're going to get into some of the details on this. Um, but let's go into this because I think this one is important. But like you said, know what's going on. Know the mission, right? Uh, we talked about know your jet. Um, minimize extraneous comms. We're going to talk about that specifically. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so share your emotion, Shaker. Go ahead. I, I have no issues, whatever have like talking on mids in a flight or something like that but there's a time and a place for it and you get some people who are just chatterboxes while you're you got your own things as a lead going on and you're trying to speak at the same time to them or the other the other jets within your flight and you can't get a word out or you can't focus on what's going on because there's this extra non-essential communication going on i've had flights i think even with flat fat or rudy like i i say what i'm doing as a lead and that and and that's it and i've had other flights where i'm constantly trying to interject in the middle of what they're saying because i can't get a word out and it's like funny because those flights where you don't say much and everybody's on the same page you get on the ground 
and then your chatterboxes with each other talking about it. But then, you know, the other the other flights where they talk too much, you get off the ground, you're like, all right, I got to go. And you just wind up getting <laughs> get, getting off the computer and just trying to decompress after that. That's because every time you communicate, every time I've got to listen, we're all spending communication do- or concentration dollars. And if you minimize that, man, by the end of the flight or when the moment's critical, you have more to spend and you aren't as drained, in my opinion. Yeah, that that actually is very, very, very true. Um, so also, and, go ahead. And not just extraneous, uh, brevity is important too. Yes. Thank God. <laughs> yes. I forgot to mention that. Brevity can, you know, one or two words can tell you so much, right? Just say established. Don't say holding, you know, alpha six. 15 block 17. Just, yeah, yeah. Just say established. <laughs> yeah. So uh, on a, on a um, note about our fan flight, I always have them call in with our heading. And sometimes they just do a lot of extra words in – my heading is uh, 257. I'm like, dude, just say in 257. Minimize the comms, right? And it's hard because they're not used to it, but it just makes it so much quicker. We can just move on. I don't need the life story. Just tell me you're in and you're heading. Um, totally agreed. Yeah, minimize all that. So focus on the task at hand. Um, you know, this is... This is what a flight lead does constantly. And so if you're on the same page with a flight lead and you know we're about to enter an AO and we're going to do a check-in with a flight with, a, you know, a, an AIC or a JTAC or whatever we're doing, um, now you're prepared. Now you've, you know, got the information and maybe you're going to have to speak up because there's different ways that some of this stuff is done. And, you know, if you know that we're in an AO and a nine line is coming and I know that you're going to be on that page and I say, you're ready and there's no delay. And you say two, right? Boom. I'm like, great. Now I can tell the JTAC we're ready and we can start getting that transmission. So you're on it. I'm on it. We're good to go. Um, the next one that I think is harder and I'm curious what you guys see is having your wingman anticipate your needs. That one's tough, especially like the newer you are. Yep. But it's kind of like what we talked about a minute ago, you know, that that moment you flip the switch from liability to asset. Those are the little things that make you an asset is, you know, knowing that like, okay, we're heading to this, this, you know, group of SAM sites or heading up to this waypoint, whatever it may be like, okay, I bet you he's probably going to have me get ready to fence in here pretty quick. You know, just be ready for that command. Not even that you have to do it yet, but just that you're mentally already ready for that thing he's about to call for cuts out that second or two you know delay that may come with like oh crap i'm not ready for fencing what's my fuel state yeah yeah yada yada. you know be on top of those things because then as soon as he calls it out you're ready to go that's for me that's something i try to focus on a lot is just being ahead of the jet ahead of the game and on the same page as the lead what if your lead is tax saturated and you're like 50 miles to the target and you're like, <clears throat> fence in. What if you helped him with that? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah, if you have the confidence. I, I've in the past, I've in the past as a wing, I've gone and said, knowing that we had to fence in and I didn't get a call yet from lead, I'll fence in and I'll say two's fenced in, you know, 10.5. Just to say, hey, look, it's time to fence in without being that guy saying, Hey, we got a fence in and then him calling it without sounding like, you know, you're a know-it-all. I just say, Hey, 50 miles out or whatever fenced in, give him the fuel state and, and go from there. Sure. I mean, I think that's kind of squadron and comfort level specific, but I wouldn't mind if someone said, Hey, should we fence in and be like, Oh shit, I didn't think about that. <laughs> let's, let's do that. It's a good idea. I was, my brain was on some other task and I was saturated and it's something we're going to talk about more later, but that's crew resource management. I mean, don't be annoying with every single thing trying to figure out where it is, but if it's very obvious to you that we should have done something, heck man, uh, be a good wingman, be my, be my teammate. Let's do it as, let's do it together. 
Absolutely. Um, all right. So this one is going to be specific to the last one. And oh boy, is this my favorite topic. Minimize radio chatter. Use the push to think, wait, push to talk button, right? Think about what you're going to say before you get on the radio. Yeah, trying to minimize all the uh's, uh, uh, think about it, say it, do it. And that's what my, we, we teach in the case one class is be ahead of those calls, you know, know your fuel states, know your altitudes, you know, be aware of all those things at all times, because then it's like Shaker just said, it'll help cut out the ums and the uhs and everything else that we naturally do. And we're just chit chatting. So staying focused on the next task, like we talked about, right. And being prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're responding to a, an interrogative and you don't a hundred percent know what the answer is yet, just, just give a standby, you know, and think like Shaker said, think about it, see what you need to say. And then, then follow up and say it. And, and I've even gotten at the point where I will think I know what to say. And I just get into mush mouth, lost it. I'll just stop transmitting. I'm like, I'm, no, just stop. <laughs> I'll, I'll come back on in the second when I rearrange the words in my head the right way. <laughs> yeah. That was your abort. Exactly. That is, oh man, that is so critical, right? That was my abort. <laughs> I've noticed you doing that before. And at first I thought your radio was just cutting out and only later did it become clear that that was intentional. <laughs> no, I was aborting. <laughs> I never called it that, but that's so perfect, right? I'm aborting the transmission. I'm going to reset because I'm just screwing this up. Yeah, you know, especially JTAC wise and, and your real JTACs. That's why, especially if it's going to be a long transmission or if, if you get mumbled up, you just say break get off the radio for a second, re, re, uh, readjust and then come back in. Absolutely. And, and everyone's been there. Everyone's done it. Everyone's gotten tongue tied. You got a lot going on. So again, give your mouth and brain the time and space to figure out what you want to say. <laughs> um, let's get into this one a little bit. So this is very near and dear to me. It goes into the, you know, not being an extra workload for everybody, but this is very calm specific. So it's in my opinion that unless it's an emergency, never interrupt radio communication on the primary frequency. So if you have a JTAC on one radio and your inner flight on another and your inner flight communicating and the JTAC speaks up, unless it's an emergency, just stop transmitting. There's nothing you're saying that's going to be more important than hearing what's going on that we're responsible for working with that guy. What do you guys think about that? Oh, this one's huge. I actually to share a personal story. I just made this mistake the other night. We were supposed to push button nine on radio one. Totally my fault. I had pushed it on radio two. So I wasn't even hearing our AWACS calling out stuff. And I went to ask a question as it's all happening. So learn that lesson the hard way. I mean, the mind can process visually as a gestalt. You can see everything and process it at once. Auditorily, you can only really hear one things at once. So that means to stop transmitting inner flight, if external flight radio comms begin to transmit again, unless it's an emergency, don't interrupt comms that are going on and stop. If those primary comms go on now, Breaking kind of both of these rules, if we're in an AO and there's a JTAC working a second flight and we've gotten our nine line and now we have some kind of sequential attack we need to work out and we got to communicate, there's going to be times where you have to do it and it's hard, but that's where brevity, short comms and being precise are key. Yeah, exactly. Call in hot with your heading and leave it at that. Right. But I may have to work an interval. We might have 30 second impacts, right? And I may have to work out, hey, are you set? All right. I want you two miles trail. I might have to make some quick thing, but it's got to be as quick as possible, right? Yeah. I yeah, agree. Get, Especially with you at the moment. Get out the meat and potatoes as fast as you can, most accurate way, and, and, and keep it clear. Yeah. And this is where 
time compression can happen without you wanting it to. You've got a mission, you've got a timeline, you got to get another wingman, there's another radio going. And this is where you want to save your concentration dollars for these critical moments. You might want to talk about your weekend and other stuff. And that can be fine in some context. But when you're on a mission, man, you want to save all of that because you know there's going to be that critical moment where something goes wrong or more than one thing is going on at a time. You don't have all the control of the situation that you want and you need to be focused at that moment, right? That's the critical moments you need that do those dollars for. Uh, anything else on this? Uh, not for me, but I've... Uh... I have a minor family situation unfolding, so oh. I'm probably going to have to run for the evening. Well, hey, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for coming here. I'm looking forward to flying with you. We're going to move on. There's only a little bit more to go, and then we're out of here. All right. Sounds good, and, and thank you. And, yeah, same same to you. And, uh, yeah, this, this is really cool. Thanks for inviting me. Yep. Right, uh, take it easy. Yep. Later, buddy. Moving on to 12. We've already really talked about this. Be prepared for tasks right? Know the context you're in and be prepared to help focus, um, you know, on what is ahead. The more the flight lead can deploy you as an asset, the more options there are to overcome the mission challenges. We've discussed that uh, a little bit before. Um, and I think it's a critical thing. I don't know if there's anything else you guys want to cover on this before we move on. I feel like we'd be beating a dead horse on that one, but we have. you know, you always strive to be that asset more than a liability. Well, you know, I wrote this down not realizing how wonderful our podcast was going to go. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's, right. If I spend a few dollars and you spend a few dollars, we'll have some left at the end of the flight. Don't make me spend all mine while you have an entire bankroll. Right. <laughs> I'll be pissed. Oh, man. All right. Um, I believe this is the last one. Oh, no. Okay. There's two more. So know the threats. Uh, know your ground vehicles, friendly and enemy. This is still one of my weak points. I don't know all the vehicles, um, in the jet or, uh, from the targeting pod. Some of them look similar. Sometimes you just can't see very well because the at is not the greatest, but you need to know those that helps you distinguish what's happening on the ground between friendly and enemy and help, you know, based on the information you're getting with teamwork that you got the right target or at least help you not blow up a good guy. Right. Yeah, that's huge. Knowing like I've made that mistake, you know, with missiles or whatever, you know, walking onto the wrong thing. But yeah, the more you can learn about all these little details, the, you know, again, the more it makes you go from that liability to an asset. Because if you have a guy next to you who knows a ton, it's just like having a second lead almost. Exactly. Yeah, um, it's just like being dedicated to what you're doing and having a pride in, in yourself and your abilities will help everybody and not just yourself because if you know your enemy threats you can help everybody as a whole not just not just flying off a wing and, and doing what you're told and not being an asset to the flight well think of it in terms too of like if you're up there with maybe a couple other you know newer guys put you in the third slot you know of all hell breaks loose and you got to break off into two flights. You know, you want to have that guy in the third slot who's experienced enough to be able to be like a mini lead if need be. Well, third is a flight lead, right? That you can break you them off. Two, pretty much. Yeah. You can break mm -hmm. them off as a second section. We fly in four ships a lot for different reasons, but I really prefer doing things in two ships. It's just so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, anyhow, so just some administrative things on this. Know the threats from your enemy aircraft, right? Know what the ranges are. Know the SAM and AAA threats in your mission. You might not need to know all of them, but if you know the RWR symbology and you're expecting to see an SA-2 and you're seeing an SA-2, now you, things are correlating and you're understanding. If suddenly you saw an SA-10, you might be like, oh, wow, things have changed a lot, right? Yes, yeah, it's, it's that part of that situational awareness we, we were talking about earlier. It's just being aware of what's going on around you is going to help you in that, that you come around on your turn, make sure you're looking at the right thing. Yep. All of it again from an asset to a, from a liability to an asset, right? And what we're really talking about is being crew resource management. 
Um, I'm sure you guys have heard this term before where you're working together as a team and you're taking your skills and your information and trying to anticipate the situation or find where there are shortfalls and working together. And I'll tell you, I fly a lot with the new guys. I take that burden on a lot for myself. It's a lot of workload. Uh, I have pretty good experience doing it. But I got to tell you, when I get to fly with one of our experienced wingmen or one of our flight leads as my wingman, oh man, feeling that crew resource management, there's like, there's just, a, there's less tension. I'm at ease. I know that I can focus easy. I can trust my guy and I know he's got my back if I screw it up. It's just a, it's such a good feeling when you fly in that situation. I mean, how have you guys felt when those differences between someone who was a liability versus someone who was an asset? Yeah, I mean, like you said, you know, it's a sense of relief once in a while to just be able to have a smooth flight where you know who you're flying with and their ability and you don't have to, I don't want to say micromanage, but you don't, you don't have to babysit or really not trust what they're going to do. And, you know, me and Fed have flown before, you know, off, you know, where we're not with a, a student and it's cool because like we just do our thing. We come in, you know, if we go, you know, drop some ordnance or, you know, fly to the boat or do whatever. And it's just like a nice, easy flight. No, no unexpected things happen. And, you know, it's it's just a comfortable feeling once in a while to to be able to just go up and be like, all right, cool. That was fun. Like, I love teaching and I love I don't I don't think it's a negative thing being with new new students or anything. But once in a while, it's nice to just kind of like fly without having the extra added stress of of having to maintain the entire flight itself as a whole. Right. And I mean, we're talking about a good wingman's guide. And if you're a good wingman, I feel like this is the pinnacle where you can do crew resource management and you can work together and you're doing true teamwork, which the reason you fly with another jet is for teamwork, right? The whole reason you have a wingman. Yeah, really? <laughs> so anyhow, I put on here that teamwork can help prevent little mistakes that can add up to big mistakes. So like we talked about before, um, you know, using brevity, helping be aware of the situation, not letting something happen, letting them know, hey, I'm getting an RWR hit over here that doesn't make any sense. And maybe he was heads down doing something else. Now you're an asset and you're working the problem together. Because I can tell you from my experience, every mission I've gone in to do, even training missions, something happens that you have to work through. And the more your wingman helps you with that, the more they're aware, the faster that happens, the less it impacts your capabilities in the mission. A hundred percent. Like it's, it's, I mean, like I said, I feel like we're beating a dead horse, but it's like, those are the little things, man, that just take you that next stage of taking the attention away from the mission or giving you more situational awareness, adding to the mission, you know? And I'm sure you guys have seen this block of Swiss cheese for CRM where the holes just line up perfectly and you go from one problem to another to another. And any one of those times you could have prevented it, but it went right through the wrong holes and now you're in a problem. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is bound to happen eventually, but, you know, cycle back to where we were kind of at where we first started. It's how you look at, uh, how, or how you react to that issue in the moment. If you panic or if you just slow down, assess, get a new game plan and attack it. Absolutely. All right. Moving on here. Um, I think we've killed this one too. All your administrative flying skills, form flying, manage your fuel, right? Using the F-Pass page. We covered radio communications, all the carrier landing stuff, your procedures. Um, you know, all of these things add up at the end of the day to being a good wingman. Um, I think we've touched on all of these. Um, you know, one thing that we can, I think, talk on, which we, we've talked about these to some extent, but just giving them a formal list um, you know, radio silence, uh, you guys ever had someone go quiet on you when they were overwhelmed? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Right. 
to me, it's the first thing that happens when you're task saturated or you're single task focused, right? You're not doing the aviate, navigate, communicate. You've lost your scan. And now you're just trying to figure out this one thing because you're so focused on it. And that's just a common wingman mistake for new guys. Um, I think it takes time to build that situational awareness, your concentration dollars, all of that stuff, right? Um, comfort on the radio, that comes from doing it. Switchology, again, from doing it. Airspace awareness, busting airspace, we talked about that. Um, we talked about allowing frustration to interrupt your decision cycles, keeping the positive mental attitude that we talked about, and knowing the mission parameters. I think we've covered all of these. Is there anything else you guys want to get into on any of these or anybody from the audience wants to talk about before we close us out? No, I think it just goes back to like we talked about a little while ago, just like the more you know your jet, the less you have to think about it while you're doing all these things. Yeah. Like you said, the more you go from a liability to an asset. And a lot of this, you know, it, it cycles back to your attitude and your, your dedication to being – being a wing and and how much effort you put into it if you put that effort in all these things are gonna fall fall right in line with each other absolutely the last thing i want to touch on and i take this very personal but your flight lead is not perfect I think it's important to realize that as a wingman and try to be a good wingman. You guys feel that uh, this is an important topic for you? I think it is for new pilots because you, I was guilty of this. You know, you get up with, especially when you get up with squadrons, you know, these guys are experienced. They don't know what they're doing, but it's just like we were saying earlier, you know, everyone makes mistakes still at the end of the day. It doesn't matter how good you are, how long you've been doing this. I guarantee if you go in the real you know, Navy and find these guys flying. They make mistakes probably on the regular. They may not be huge, but they're there. Uh, you know, it's acknowledging that and realizing like, yeah, you need to be up in your game because otherwise you're just taking the, taking their eyes off the ball. Yeah. And you know, what I wrote here is if you see a problem that needs to be addressed, speak up. You're part of the team if you got the situational awareness, if you understand the context and you feel it needs to be said, say it. I'm never going to get upset for you getting my back and helping me see something I didn't see. I'm going to be happy about it. I don't know how you guys feel about that. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's constructive feedback. It's pretty much everything, isn't it? Like worst case scenario, if I were to come, if I'm the, the wingman, you're my lead, you know, and I say, hey, isn't the waypoint supposed to be X, Y or Z? you know, worst case, you're going to come back and just go, no, you know, it's, it's this, this, and that we, we worked through the quick little problem we may or may not have seen. It may not even be a problem, but you know, at the worst case it shows that my buddy's at least paying attention. Yeah. absolutely. I'm sorry. What were you saying, Shaker? I said, absolutely. You know, like being aware and help and speaking up just, it proves as, you know, you as a lead, it, it, it just shows that the wing is actually is paying attention and is on top of their game. Yeah. And, you know, uh, RB in here says it's easy for a good wingman to be a lot more detached than the lead and to be further ahead of the jet uh, than lead is because of the reduced workload. And my response is that is the entire point uh, of a wingman of teamwork, right? Absolutely. Uh, so the last topic I think we should talk about before we'll end this, because um, we basically just talked about team teamwork wins for crew resource management, but your flight lead, they may push you beyond your limits. Um, I've done it uh, accidentally to one of our guys. <laughs> I took him into a situation. He was performing very well, and it was just very obvious that this particular thing was way over it, and we had to change it. And I think it's on a flight lead to understand that, but I think it's also on a wingman to say, Hey man, I'm, I just, I'm not where I should be and, and communicate with that. You guys dealt with people where you've maybe pushed them beyond their limits. Oh yeah. In our, in our training, it's, it's easy to do, especially with students who are hungry to learn. You, you want to start dumping because they're sponges at that point. You want to start dumping information 
then it can all go sour because then they're just overloaded. But, you know, and vice versa, I've done the same thing, you know, just pu- being pushed too far and not saying anything. And then it creates a headache down the road, whatever it may be. But sometimes it's good, though. You know, sometimes it's if you aren't pushed, sometimes, though, you're never going to get out of your comfort zone. So it's good for your flight lead to push you. But, you know, it's walking a tightrope act because you don't want to push him so hard that the helmet fire starts everything else. But sometimes it's good to, you know, push them a little bit into something they may not be 100 percent comfortable with. But if you got confidence in them, push them a little bit. I'd like to get just a little bit of constant smoke in the cockpit, not fire, just a little smoke. <laughs> when I, I'm training I, people. I mean, I think pushing pushing someone to their limit knowing where that limit is and then pushing them past that limit a little bit will help them increase their limit, not wanting to do that all the time, but it helps show or find where your limit or where their limit is to, to advance themselves further in the future. Well, there's nothing more rewarding than when you do land after that mission, you know, like, We've all been there where it's, you know, whether you're new or experienced, whatever, but you do that mission or that training night where it's just, there's a lot going on. You start getting, you know, your limits push, whatever. But then when you push through it, you come back, you land, you you powered through whatever adversity you found that night. You you know, that's why we play this game at the end of the day is, is for those experiences. So they're, they're good to have, but you know, like we said before, it's, you don't want to go too far with it. Well, it gets back to the quantity versus quality uh, in this. This is in the quantity or the quality category. But if you start to push them too far, they're not going to learn. And so the quality drops. Exactly. Well, this is um, all I had written down. Is there anything else you guys wanted to cover before we end this? Anything we've missed out of this topic that you think is important? I honestly, I thought we covered a lot of really good stuff. Like it, you know, the biggest thing, like, I just keep stressing is just that keep pushing yourself to be part of the team and not just, you know, the guy sitting there asking questions. And don't, you know, you'll be that guy asking questions. You know, don't be afraid to be that guy, but strive to not be that guy. What are your thoughts, Grendel? I don't have any thoughts. <laughs> You're so lying. <laughs> Oh man, Shaker, you have any thoughts on this topic before we close everything out? I I mean, I think we hit everything perfectly. Uh you know, I like I said earlier, I love putting a wing as a lead once in a while just to put them in our shoes to open up their their horizons on when they're on the wing, like okay, maybe maybe I'm not going to I'm not going to uh I'm definitely going to pay attention to what's going on because I don't want to ask extra questions because I wasn't, I wasn't paying attention in the lesson or the brief or whatever. Um, Only, only to help us out as, as a lead and be successful as a team. Yeah. And you know, I, I should push tack lead to, you know, wingman more often. Sometimes I just get so in the mindset of leading a flight, I forget to give those opportunities when, when they arise. Um, so no, I, I think that's a good lesson. Um, you know, we've been discussing this for like almost three hours now. I appreciate people coming on and watching. If there's things we missed, put them in the comments of the video. I'll happily try to respond. Excuse me. <coughs> and um, I appreciate everyone being here. I appreciate the Hornet School being involved and you guys coming here. This is a topic that I want to discuss for a long time. I'm very passionate about DCS and the community and working with the people. I appreciate all the people in chat today and the interaction. Um, I hope that, you know, somewhere in here you've learned something. Maybe it's inspired you to go to Hornet School or join a squadron. There's a link down and below in the Hornet School. If you want to support them, man, they do need mentors and people who are of the same mentality. Um, I really appreciate uh, the comments we've got on some of the other videos and some of the feedback. And, uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, anybody got anything else to say before we close out tonight? 
no, we just want to say thank you for having us and, you know, all your support throughout our whole little endeavor here, man. It's, it's meant the world to us. Well, I'm happy yeah, to, absolutely. thank you. I'm happy to have you guys. I'm great. I'm grateful to see the response from the community and I look forward to our next broadcast. Wow. Broadcast. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll be here whenever you need us, man. Awesome. Well, again, thank you all. Uh, if you like what we're doing, subscribe, like, comment, share the video, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.